I can see you. You live on Facebook? Yeah. You on Facebook and YouTube or just? Um. Um, hello everybody, um, welcome again into our another tasting, this time we're going diving into the world of world whiskies from different parts of the world I suppose, so um, I'm joined by Chris again obviously, uh, Chris is going to help me dissect all the drums and give his honest opinion if he likes them or not. Um, We'll see how it goes. Um, so yeah, like I mean, the the whole concept behind the station was actually trying to uh, give some spotlight into countries that you may or may not have heard that actually produce their own uh, whiskies. Um, world of Irish and Scottish and Japanese whiskies is so big and growing so fast at such a quick pace that you know it's kind of hard to um, realize that they're not the only whiskey producers in countries in the world and there's plenty of other places and plenty of other small time producers that uh, uh, have their own really good slice of the whiskey industry and um, we just want to show that you know it's it's uh, doesn't it doesn't have to be made in Ireland Scotland uh, Japan or US that the whiskey to be good can be made anywhere anywhere in the world as long as the right processes and the uh, you know the right uh, idea behind it is there um, and you know people that are driven and you know passionate about the industry are doing what they love so this kind of a shout out to all these people that are behind them that you know may be struggling because they're not based in Scotland or Ireland and you know it doesn't carry that uh, name or that you know provenance as you get with other countries so here's them for them to show that um, whiskies can be made good in anywhere in the world doesn't matter where you are as long as you're doing the right things um 
so yeah, we'll start off with uh, Italian whiskey first. So uh, this is called Puni Alba, and this is their third batch. Um, so Puni in itself uh, started working in, they laid down the foundations to the distillery in 2010. Uh, it is owned by Evans Burger family. Um, maybe the name doesn't sound too Italian, but that's because the northern part of Italy, where this whiskey is from, is from Glorenza, uh, Northern Alps. Um, that part of Italy was actually uh, part of Austria-Hungarian Empire for quite some time, for majority of its uh, time. Um, so a lot of names and a lot of uh, cities and towns actually sound German or have a German name. Glorenza actually is the Italian version of the original name. The original name is more Germanic. And uh, yeah, so they, they laid down the foundations in 2010. Uh, the distillery, by the way, I think it's one of the most beautiful distilleries uh, I've seen, like small time distilleries anyway. Uh, Italians always have this flair for um, for lovely design. You can also see it by the bottle. You know, it's quite striking to look at something quite unusual, like you'd never see a bottle in that kind of shape uh, or that kind of color uh, anywhere. I've, I've never seen anything like that. So they're pushing the boundaries when it comes to design, definitely. Um, the distillery is a 13 meters by 13 meters uh, cube. So it looks like a big giant cube made out of red brick. So. The inside of the building is just a normal kind of building uh, painted in black and then on the outside it's like a, a red brick cube with spaces in between the, the bricks. So the light <clears> kind of passes through really nicely uh, in, in summer days. So it, it really is striking to look at. Uh, the stills themselves are a little bit lower down. So when you walk into the distillery, you have like a glass floor and you look down on the two stills. So it's, it really is amazing. If you ever get a chance to, to have a look at that, it's, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic piece of architecture, it really is. I was wondering about that because as you're saying, the still itself has dropped into the floor. Mm. I was wondering if the bottle shape actually had anything to do with the I, stills because the line in the middle usually suggests. Could, could very well be. I mean, the building in the inside is black and then it's kind of built around with a red brick. But as I was saying, they're still sitting down low. They're kind of underground. So maybe that's the idea that, you know, they kind of get a two-tone uh, going. So are they really like the Kuiper and juggling? Because they really yeah, like juggling. exactly. Yeah, maybe yeah, actually for juggling, it'd be a nice bottle to uh, to catch for sure. Uh, Puni, make a flare competition and get this guy some prizes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, for their mash bill, uh, they actually use three types of grains. So they use barley, rye, and wheat. Uh, barley is outsourced from either Germany or Scotland, and it comes in malted. Uh, rye and wheat is local, but they don't malt it in Italy. They malt it in Germany, and then it's shipped back. Uh, predominantly in the mash bill, it's uh, malted barley, but uh, there is wheat and rye in it as well. Um, they use rye and wheat because it's commonly grown in, in that area. And the design of the building, as I was saying with the red bricks, actually comes from the granaries where the grain was kept by the farmers to help the aeration through the building. So that's where they got the idea from the building. Um, they have five fermenters uh, made out of large, so they don't, they don't have stainless steel. They have large, they say that the lactic acid bacteria, that's what they're looking for uh, in, their, in, their, in their wort. Uh, the fermentation takes about 96 hours, obviously plus minus, it really depends on the day. Um, they use dry distillers yeast and the beer is at around 7% uh, when, it's, uh, when it's ready. Uh, then it's double distilled. Uh, the stills are actually quite unique uh, for Puni. They're made by Foresight but uh, the heating system that they're using was uh, solely designed for them, the Foresight's never done that kind of heating system before. It's a double coil. Uh, that's also the water inside is pressurized, so the temperature can go up slightly higher than with normal water. As you know, uh, water um, evaporates 100 degrees. The water in the pipes in the heating system is at around 110, 120. So the pressure helps the water to be at a higher temperature. So Foresight's never installed that before, so it's quite unique. Uh, the wash and the spirit still respectively, they're three and 2,000 liters. And the shape of them is very similar to the shape of uh, Glenmorangie stills. Um, 
they don't actually have a master distiller or a master blender. Uh, the, the Ebensberger family, which owns the distillery, they come together as a family and uh, they decide on all the products themselves and they sign off on them by themselves. Uh, another interesting piece that you may not see in any other uh, parts of the world anymore is the f way that the the taxman is treating alcohol in there. Like, I mean, it's absolutely mad. Back in the day, obviously, the, sp the spirit safe was there for the taxman to, you know, be able to uh, have control over what's going in and out uh, of the stills. That's only there now for kind of cosmetic purposes now because there's other ways of... Uh, you know, measuring how much uh, whiskey was made by the taxman, but the Italy still goes kind of by the older rules. So any pipe, any vessel, anything that will have alcohol or has alcohol has to be tax sealed by the taxman in Italy. So Lena, which was very kind, uh, giving me a lot of information about their distillery, said that they have more or less 200 different tax stamps and different things in the distillery, which is just absolutely bananas. Like you can imagine that, uh, what, like everyday work of this, there is much, much harder when you have so many tax stamps that you have to worry about not to break them because you know you get in trouble. And it's the same story with uh, maturation warehouses, everything is sealed by the tax man and the seals can't be broken until a mountain of paperwork is given to the taxman to let them even take their own liquid. So quite unique. Uh, they have two types of maturation warehouses. Uh, first of them is above the ground, uh, just a dunnage uh, warehouse, you know, racking system. Uh, barrels on the side, about five, four or five high, depending on obviously the sizes of the barrels. And then they also use uh, World War II bunkers. Uh, we haven't seen any whiskey from those bunkers yet. They say that they're keeping those whiskeys that are stored in those bunkers for uh, longer maturation, so 10 years or over. They're not there yet. The first whiskey they released was in 2005, so they're just over halfway mark to their 10 years period. They said that if they're not happy, they're happy to move them up above and you know extend the maturation if it needs to be. Uh, the maturations in the warehouses above ground, it, the temperature fluctuations is quite big. It could be as up, upwards of 40 degrees Celsius between the seasons. So um, ages shares at 5%, so it's quite high uh, for Europe anyway. It's uh, it's, it's quite significant, uh, significant loss uh, in the barrels. Um, in this whiskey, it's a three-year-old uh, malt. Obviously, it can't be called single malt because they're not using barley only. They use three types of grains, so it's a malt whiskey. And it's three years old in Marsala barrels, which they predominantly get from two suppliers, uh, Conti Florio and Pellegrino. Uh, that's where they get most of their Marsala. And they also use bourbon, uh, obviously bourbon barrels. They use uh, certain uh, Italian wine barrels from diff various different uh, suppliers. And they also use ex Isle barrels, which is in this one. So what they did was they aged it for three years in ex Marsara barrel, and then they finished it for about six months in ex Isle barrel. Uh, Isle barrels come from Ardbeg, and the way they also buy their uh, bourbon barrels is through a different distiller. So I would imagine that they have a deal signed with Ardbeg. They're getting both their bourbon barrels, which Ardbeg or orders in their name, which you take those, and then they also take uh, the ex or ex bag barrels. Uh, the barrels they use, uh, the ex bag barrels they use, they were uh, used for about 15 to 21 years uh, for Ardbeg whiskey. So I'd, I would say, I'd imagine the barrel is quite heavily influenced by the peat. And I definitely say you can pick up that in, uh, in this whiskey. Um, so yeah, let's have a little nose. Um, the longer this is in the glass, it seems to be changing quite a lot. Like, I mean, when you get at the start, you obviously get in a lot of uh, that, that peatiness. Uh, there's a good bit of sweetness behind it, though, as well. And that's it. It kicks off with a good bit of sweetness. Once you get used to that, you can kind of get that bitterness coming through. Yeah. Kind of smoke. Mm. For something that spent three years in Marsala, it's not as kind of fruity and that kind of um, 
almost that pastry style that you get off a of sawthorn is not that much sweetness coming off the the bat itself it's more kind of like um steep grapes at the start steep grapes mm -hmm. i see what you mean um yeah it's and pete in the background it's, it's a great compliment to it like it's it's a very very small background note if you didn't say that this was in x airbag barrels yeah. it would be one of those notes in the back that would almost annoy you that you can't put your finger on yeah it, it's a small bit salty it's a small bit salty kind of like yeah yeah kind of that saline kind of um uh, sensation we'd be used to using yeah um that kind of a note to it but you can't really put your finger on and say that it's completely and utterly got a peat influence to it until you say the word peat and then it starts to jump out at you yeah marsala um marsala definitely doesn't give as much off as they usually like you usually get that like bold nuttiness uh, there isn't as much of that but there is quite a lot more fruits like dark fruits mm -hmm. in this than you will get marsala like i always find marsala very nutty any finish with marsala i find it very nutty you're uh, saying there's a few italian wines involved in it as well so that could be where you're getting your dark fruit from no no not with this one uh, this one's one. solely marsala and exile but they okay. they do for different ones like they did a couple of limited editions that they've used uh some okay. some wine uh, finishes as well in the other ones they do gold which is all bourbon five-year all bourbon uh alba nero nero is all marsala i think i think it's a five or six year old all marsala as far as i remember i could be i could be talking out of my backside now but uh there's about four that they have um in their core range this is one of them one of their core ranges and then they have three or four that were limited edition um so yeah this is one of their flagships anyway on the palette the peat is obviously very very evident but you get a lot of that nuttiness in the background yeah um for a three-year-old i mean it, there's a quite a lot of um quite a lot of bold flavors usually you know uh, three-year-old or three and three and a half year old whiskey really that, that this one is um is um much more spirit forward this this isn't as much a spirit forward as i thought it would be and it's at 46 percent as well so it's a, is it a 46 no sorry it's a 43 it's a little bit stronger as well so you'd think that the the spirit component would be more prevalent but actually it's tamed down a lot by the two barrels that they've used like for something in um, an ex Marsala cast for so long, you get a good bit of sweetness from wheat, which we know from uh, malted barley, you get a good bit of sweetness from rye. You can get a lot of oiliness, creaminess, and kind of spice to it. Each one of them have like different attributes. But for something to have to be solely in Marsala before it touches the eyelid, there's a good mouthfeel to it. Yeah. But it's more, for me anyway, it's more something that I would associate with a peated whiskey than I would with something with a peat finish. Mm -hmm. Like usually peat finishes are in the background as yeah. opposed to being this is yeah, yeah. quite a lot forward more than in the background. Yeah, then again, right. Ardbeg is Ardbeg. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it the, is a monster. No. Very like very interesting. I, I'm very positively surprised how the eye the effect of the, the art bag had had on this. It's it's very pleasant. Now and obviously not not all people um like peated whiskey um but yeah this is actually a nice introduction to something maybe that wasn't peated at the start but was peated kind of at the end I, I, I think it's a nice introduction for someone that you know maybe want to experiment a little bit more with peated whiskies um yeah um i'd love to try the the full marasara uh, finish so maybe down the line we'll do a tasting and hopefully we'll see uh puni back with the full marasara finish see how how that flavor progressed with their unique mash bill that they're using like i think it works quite well with that that different mash bill um the combination is, is quite tasty i think mm. it's quite strange for something that is got such a high peated influence for the finish of it to not be bone dry and kind of it isn't no. at it. yeah well, you can kind of get the sweetness from the marsala really saving the end of it kind of lengthening it out and out and out yeah um yeah, it, it, great combination. I think that the two buyers work very well together. Um, we, we had this conversation before with when we were tasting the Friends of Brew Cladic. Mm -hmm. I got a sample of Ryan, uh, the Nom Nom Nom, and that yeah. was the super, 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 super heavy piece. Like, That's was that... the uh, Syrah cask? Yes, yeah, yeah that one. Because mm -hmm. I like got 150 ppm or something like yeah. that. 
And like, I mean, you wouldn't like it was heavily peated, but you would never say that was 150 ppm. I mean, we'd say it was less than half of that. Um, so Small yeah, drop of water and you, it brings it to your senses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. No, and but yeah, it's it was quite quite much tamer than I expected it to be. Anyway, so yeah, it's quite nice. Um, obviously, we're we're getting a little bit a little bit more into our peated whiskies now with the peated taste that you've organized beforehand so i think uh, people appreciated this uh, a little bit more in ireland which back in the day wasn't yep. wasn't as appreciated uh but yeah um, go Pete. the world's smallest bit of water so usually with peated whiskies you have um phenol compounds will sit on the top of the, the liquid itself and they don't break loose when you put in a little bit of water it's like water and oil they separate and usually what happens with a properly peated whiskey is the smoke itself like really becomes um big and bold it sits on the surface like smoke on water if you believe in the songs but um <laughs> that seems to be doing the slight opposite it's bringing out the marsala a little yeah, bit more yeah it does it's it's softening down the peat definitely like it wasn't it wasn't strong at the beginning in the first place but it definitely softened them much more than you'd expect it i think it's the fact that the peat is the cask as opposed to any of the liquid it's obviously it will uh, attach itself to the liquid and a lot flavor but because the liquid itself is unpeated i think you don't you have the polar opposite to a normal peated whiskey where you'd have the the phenols kind of opening up and separating that's just trying to net for me anyway the peat and you're getting that marsala yeah yeah definitely um so yeah, um, that was Puni. So yeah, three-year-old Asian Marsala finished in, in uh, Exile, uh, Ardbeg. Uh, three types of uh, grains in the distillate, so a little bit more unique than usual. And yeah, I'd love to love to see more out of them. Um, really interested how how the the World War Two bunkers uh, warehouses will work out. But obviously we're still not close enough to it but yeah I'd, I'd be very excited to have a look and see hopefully when the lockdown is down maybe we even go and visit you know like the distillery as i said it's it's stunning to look at like i mean you just look at the pictures and you want to live there it's fantastic so big props for the design and the bottles and the whiskey itself obviously as well um yeah move on to the next one i suppose um how do people find it so far uh, i wonder uh yay on the peat nay on the peat um do, do you think that the marsala is more prevalent or is the peat that's more prevalent uh give us a shout in the comments if there is anything that you jumping out at you at all uh anyway we'll move on uh so this is called the dune eden double wood uh, it's a 15 year old uh, whiskey from New Zealand this time. Uh, so, came a very, very, very long way uh, to get here to this table and to your glasses. Um, so, the distillery was founded by the Baker family in 1974 and it was built up upon a different distillery called Water of Leith uh, Brewery and Distillery and has been there since 1800s um the baker family uh were making different kind of uh, spirits vodka gin there was uh, obviously whiskey uh they made i think there's four types as wilson's there was 45 south there was lammer law and there was milford so they had the four brands the first was the um, first brands they released was uh wilson's and 45 south and then in the 80s, uh, Seagram's bought over the distillery and Seagram's owned it till about 1997. So under Seagram's, uh, they're doing very well. Uh, they're releasing quite a, a lot of uh, really nice uh, single malts, which was Mal uh, Lummer Law and Milford. Lummer Law is actually named after local uh, mountain range. So it's all kind of kept local. The name in itself, Dunedin, is uh, old uh, Scots Gaelic uh, stands for Edinburgh. So obviously there's a lot of Scottish uh, 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 Scot uh, Scottish immigrants that arrived to the area and they decided to name the town of Dunedin after Edinburgh, but just in a kind of uh, bastardized uh, English version of the Scots Gaelic, I suppose. Sorry, Ryan, if you're listening. Uh, but I double checked with Ryan if I, if I was correct now, but yeah, that, that, that's where the name originates of the town from anyway. Um, so Seagram's owned it and they are making whiskey and then in 
Seagram's was getting into financial trouble in late 90s and they were basically offloading all the alcohol companies and distilleries and brands that they had. It was something like 250 brands that they had in the portfolio. So they got rid of all of it. They ceased the, the company ceased to exist, I think, in 2000, 2001. Uh, they sold this distillery to Foster's of Australia, but they didn't share the same love for making whiskey. So what they did was they dismantled the whole thing and shipped it to Fiji. And I actually have a room that was made in the same still in the same uh basically the stereos that was just shipped over to fiji and yeah so like we've tasted both the rum made in the same uh, uh same stills and we've tasted the whiskey that are made in the same stills uh so it's it's quite unique to see uh the same equipment being used in the two different distilleries and two different parts of the world there's quite a bit of a distance between fiji, fiji and uh, new zealand so uh, quite interesting the way they've done it um so yeah in 97 the distillery ceased stopped producing whiskey and what they did was they sold off the equipment separate and then whatever remaining cast they sort of separate and they sold it to a company called preston's and then preston's sold it back to the New Zealand whiskey company, which is them now. And what they did was they've uh, uh, kept the last remaining stocks and slowly start treacling them into the market. They they did a, a couple of different ones. And they did a 15, 16, 18, I think 20 year old. And then they did some smaller bottles of cask strength of the same whiskey. Uh, and they're coming close to being all gone. Uh, all empty so there isn't many casks left uh, but luckily the New Zealand whiskey company just set up a partnership with a brewery called Spates in Dunedin and what they did was Spates said that they will provide them with beer so they'll make them beer obviously they're quite experienced in making beer already so there isn't much of a difference making beer for whiskey and making beer for uh, for beer um, and they also given them some space in the unused part of the brewery so basically they're setting up a distillery right beside the brewery and it's going to be i think a really nice relationship uh down the line in the in the future it's still not worked out yet obviously COVID probably has stopped their plans a little bit like anyone else's uh but yeah it'd be very exciting to see what the future holds for the new zealand whiskey company uh, i'd like to thank uh, laura and michael for being absolute fantastic with responding to all my questions that i had uh, they're really awesome and i hope that you know the new project that they're working on will succeed and you know will take them far and hopefully we'll get to taste uh their new whiskey down the line um he was very helpful actually telling me how the distillery worked back in the day and had loads of information i i, I wasn't even expecting getting any any information in regards to how the whiskey was made uh because it has been closed for over 20 years you know and dismantled and shipped over different to different country altogether so they actually had um, both column stills and uh, pot stills. Um, they fermented uh, their beer in 30,000 liters stainless steel vats. Uh, and very interestingly, they, they were making whiskey out of 100% unmalted barley. So there was no malt in it whatsoever. It's completely raw as it comes from the field, really. And they're making beer out of that. And then they were distilling that in a column still um but they are also making malted whiskey they never uh were mixing uh, malted and unmalted barley in a batch they either made 100 percent unmalted or 100 percent malted uh so the fermentation times and the strength of the beer was obviously there's a quite a bit of a difference uh the malted barley took only 48 uh, to 72 hours to um to be ready whereas uh the unmalted barley was uh, it took over 96 hours, so there's a quite a bit of a difference. Uh, strength of the beer was also quite different, so unmalted barley was around 5.6%, whereas malted barley was on 7.6. Um, the unmalted all components were distilled in a column still, and then malted components were distilled in a pot still. The pot stills were made by a local company called AMT Burtz, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, in 1969 and they're quite different as well because they had a stainless steel bottom as opposed to copper and then the rest 
of the steel was made out of copper, so the bottom was just uh, out of stainless steel, probably just cost reduction. I would imagine getting anything to New Zealand is probably quite costly, I'd imagine. So you'd be trying to um, trying to cut costs wherever you can. Um, but yeah, the stills are still used. They've been made in you know late 60s, and they're still used today in uh, South Pacific distillery in Fiji. Uh, so it's quite cool. Um, when the distillery closed down, the initially the barrels were aged at Dunedin Airport and that was uh, it's on in the plains it's very uh, very close to a swamp so the humidity is quite high um the angel's share wasn't that big it was only at two and a half percent um so very close to Ireland and then when the barrels were acquired by Preston's they moved them to town of Omaru which is 200 meters from the coast so more kind of a coastal um climate going through and that's where this whiskey spent most of its time there it was aged six years in ex bourbon barrels and the ex bourbon barrels come from four roses they had a partnership uh, with four roses at the time when they were acquiring the barrels and then uh, the wine barrels are ex new zealand pinot noir they're made out of french oak and they come from a winery called mills reef as far as I remember, um, yeah. So six years in six years in the ex bourbon, and then nine years in the ex Pinot Noir barrel. So um, Michael was saying that they didn't do heavy filtration, so they wanted to keep, I'd say, a good flavor, a good amount of flavor from the wine barrels uh, in the bottle. The bottle. The whiskey in the bottle when it came was quite cloudy. I would say you'd be able to pick up uh, that in your glass a little bit as well, I'd say. Uh, <clears throat> since it was kind of lightly filtered and it traveled such a huge distance to get here, the temperature fluctuations during transport probably were significant. So obviously the sedimentation happened much quicker. And I think this was bottled in 2015, 16. So, I mean, it spent a few years in the bottle as well. So that kind of sedimentation is is uh, common for something that was so lightly um, filtered and it was using, you know, a quite a fresh, I would imagine it was a quite a fresh barrel as well. Um, so yeah, that's probably where you're getting the sedimentation from. So it's, uh, sorry, the blend of this is 70% malted, 30% all malted uh, distillate. So as I was saying before, 70% is the, uh, the malted parts was made fully out of malted barley and the 30% was fully made out of unmalted barley. So quite unique. I've I've never seen or tasted whiskey that had some completely unmalted component that was mixed at the end rather than mixed at the start of making a making a, a beer or a wort. Well, that's the thing. They're making life extremely difficult on yeah. themselves because yeah. malted, as you know, is sugar. And the more sugar you have, the more alcohol. Um, just on the comments, uh, John Ramirez was making a guess at a red wine or a port cast maturation um, because of the massive coloration. Yeah. On it. So Pinot Noir, as you said. Pinot Noir, yeah. And then Ona Sullivan is getting coconut sweetness off the nose. Coconut. Yeah. You can see that with coconut fibers. Yes. Yeah. It's the, it's it, it's definitely the 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 why I I. I Genuinely thought that the wine influence is going to be much more in your face, but it's actually quite a lot more subtle than you'd expect it to be. Certainly on the nose, anyway. Obviously, we haven't got to the palate yet. But... Yeah. Like I mean, that that whiskey traveled quite a, a quite a big distance, so the sedimentation is um, is expected, especially when it's so lightly lightly filtered. Well, yeah. Immediately, you get that dryness tannin from the wine. Yeah. Um, obviously, Pinot Noir would be one of the lighter red wines, um, so you wouldn't be getting as much much tannins anyway. But it, they are very prevalent here anyway. Um, but the, the the vanilla sweetness from from bourbon is actually they are quite a bit there, lingering in in between the notes, kind of you know mm -hmm. jumping in and then jumping out. Uh, so it has a nice kind of balance um, with regards to the two flavors, you know, kind of nice bitter tannins, you know, with a lot of kind of sour grape juice maybe going through. And then that little hint of sweetness jumping in and out at you. So, yeah. And just off the common strong bourbon influence on the nose, 
love the smell there from John. And Jeff, I can see where you're coming from with that kind of sour grape when you're actually fermenting wine itself and the, you have the grape skin and the, the fruit itself is getting yeah. really, really sour and really bitter. Um, the red wine influence for me anyway on that is more that kind of uh, almost like your your word for your, <clears throat> your word for beer, but more along the lines of uh, that kind of word for wine, that grape mm -hmm. actually fermenting itself, real high kind of um, ester smell off of it. There's loads of layers to it, but um, I don't. The, the bourbon cask is really prevalent on the nose. Yeah. But I don't know if there's a ton of bourbon sweetness on the palate. It seems to be more that red wine, bitter, sour, pulling forward. Yeah. So you get the, the polar opposite. You get more bourbon on the nose and in the on the mm -hmm. on the nose, and then you get uh, more flavor of the wine on the palate. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice balance um, between the two. I think. Certainly, if you didn't know that there was red wine involved in this, you'd almost think that there was an off note, that something was not as it seems or not as it should be. Mm -hmm. But knowing that there's that Pinot Noir in there, it does kind of make sense of that kind of sour element. Yeah, there. yeah, no, it, it, I, I do find it quite quite sour on the mm -hmm. on the sour side anyway. Um, honestly, I, I I think this would be great in like a very simple cocktail like something along the lines of like a, um, a daiquiri with a whiskey or something along those lines i think it would stand its ground nicely or even manhattan you know um mm -hmm. the, the the red wine would definitely add a nice sweetness behind it so yeah uh unfortunately there wasn't many there wasn't many bottles made as i said there's only 443 barrels left after with the, after willow bank closed so uh there isn't much left but luckily they you know they're they're restarting the production hopefully uh, they've gone to bigger and better things. Uh, like I, I find it absolutely amazing that this bottle traveled for such a long distance and managed uh, to get here to us. And you know, we were able to um, to taste something from so far away. Um, and not many people got to try it as well. There haven't been many bottles. I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly on the numbers, but I wouldn't say it was in hundreds of thousands anyway. With 440 barrels, you, know, you get what mm -hmm. roughly 30,000. No, sorry, that, that'd be 100. Uh, if you're talking wine barrels, they're usually around 125 liters. So you're talking I think, I think the, I think Mills Reef was actually using 300 liter hogsheads uh, okay. for for their um, maturation. Now I could be wrong because I was just mm -hmm. I was looking at pictures of the barrels that they had on their mm -hmm. site, and they seemed quite big. They seemed like hogsheads to me, but I, again, that was I was just guessing from the pictures uh, of that, so I wasn't I wasn't too sure if uh, if that's the case um yeah like i mean it's uh it's something different um but yeah they're as you were saying they're making their life much harder for themselves by uh making a hundred percent non malted barley it's not impossible but um it's definitely much harder and it's much harder to control the quality of your wort because it can get sour very quickly mm -hmm. and you really need to keep an eye on it very uh very significantly they're saying that is because they didn't want to get that malted barley flavor through uh, and that's why they didn't they, they used unmalted um yeah like i mean probably you're not getting it from there because there's only 30 percent of that blend is, is that unmalted component so you're not getting it as much but hey i take their word for it if that's what they're saying i totally believe them well that's it they're stripping through a column still as well yeah so if they did if they did a, a flip reverse of what we're used to where it's like 95 96 percent uh maize corn, yeah i think that's uh, that's what the strand that they're distilling yeah. at as well yeah. so it was coming so, out and if they that. um if they use like 90 95 or 95 96 percent maize and five four percent barley or malted barley like where you're using such a small proportion mm. that the overall flavor doesn't show malted barley but yeah. it does drive the sugars up yeah if they were doing that with the the unmalted then it I'd say they get a higher um, yield out of fermentation. Mm -hmm. They definitely get it quicker and larger. They could food. possibly also use it's some good. enzymes as well um, to kind of counter the lack of enzymes that you're you getting. Almost guarantee it. Yeah, like I, I would imagine. I would imagine that, that there was some enzymes added just because to make it a little bit easier. Um, like it must be very difficult to to to, to distillation of one malted barley. You were saying stainless steel fermentation, weren't you? Yes, stainless steel fermentation tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty thousand no, liters. The, the sourness that you're getting from it, obviously, we're thinking and trying to attribute to the red wine barrels. But I was thinking, as you're saying, with the first one, when it comes to wood and lactic acid, mm -hmm. which is a, an off note and a kind of sour note. Yeah, yeah. 
it, that it could have been, could have been. Yeah. But I, if, I, it's, if it's stainless steel then yeah no it was definitely stainless steel you had 12 stainless steel fermentation tanks of all 13,000 litres so okay. quite a big operation uh, 12 tanks that big yeah they could do quite a lot of damage you know and uh, definitely uh yeah so well done guys and hopefully we'll see some other really good whiskies down the line when you know when you're set up in the spades uh brewery and yeah we're looking forward to taste more down the line in the future when you guys are ready uh give us a shout when you are and we'll definitely have you back on uh so yeah that was uh done eden uh double wood and uh, we'll move on to mac moira yes very nice uh, yeah, so Mark Moira, uh, that's a whiskey from Sweden. Um, so Hadebra. Um, Mark Moira started, it was kind of an idea of eight friends that they had on a skiing trip. So they all came together. They met annually on a skiing trip. And then they, they realized that most of them brought a bottle of single malt scotch. And you know, they obviously had a couple of glasses here and there, and they sat down on evening and then they, they looked and taught him. We all brought a scotch and why is there why isn't there a Swedish uh, single malt distillery uh, at all? There wasn't there wasn't anything like that uh, before. There there was some imitation whiskies, Swedish whiskies made before, but it wasn't close to a genuine whiskey. And they start questions like, is it even possible to do good quality um whiskey in Sweden? And then you have to ask yourself where it is and what is it, what is it famous for? And number one thing that struck me was absolute. And that's where, where it's from. So obviously the grain quality is quite good if absolute. Uh, you know, it'd be one of my, my favorite uh, vodkas anyway. I usually don't drink vodka, even though I'm Polish. It doesn't agree with me. I do some stupid things after it, so I just tend to stay away. But if I, if I do happen to drink a vodka, it'd usually be absolute. Um, and then obviously you have um, kind of the uh, Sweden is quite long and you know go, goes quite up far north. So obviously they have a lot of glaciers and snow and water quality would be very good. Uh, so obviously they had the good grains, they had the good water, and they said, yeah, well, look, we have all the ingredients to make really good whiskey. Why won't we just do it? <laughs> and that's what they did. Uh, they set up McMurray Company in '98, and December 1899 they started distilling. The first two stills that they had were tiny. They are handmade. Literally, the lads were just hammered in with the copper, uh, out of copper, uh, by themselves. And they only were able to make 30 liters of new make spirit every day. So obviously, filling up a bourbon barrel wasn't really advisable for them because they just wouldn't be able to um, to sustain that. You know, fill up one barrel take you a week, like to um, to make it make sure it was full so they decided to look for other alternatives and they came up with an idea to have 30 liter barrels they found a, a swedish guy that was able to make it for them and that's what they went to and in 2001 they opened their first distillery called brook and then they started doing a reserve program a cask program where they're selling 30 liter barrels to their customers and that's how they started really uh, they haven't been really releasing anything of uh, of anything else rather than just doing a reserve program for their customers whoever obviously uh, decided to put their money where the mouth is um slowly started working in on that um the brook distillery uh was set up at an old mill and water uh electricity plant uh, with a like a water wheel, you know, get, getting the electricity going. And that was built on an estate that used to refine iron. So they used to make pig iron up there. Um, and you, you'll see the whole iron uh, kind of vibe go, coming through the whole uh, McMoyra whiskey uh, company. Um, they weren't able, they basically, the company grew over time and they were getting more and more customers started releasing their own whiskeys as well. Uh, they ended up in 2011, they ended up um, looking at their options, well, in two, sorry, in 2009, they ended up looking at their options. The building that the, the Brook distillery that the building would, uh, was in, it was listed, so they couldn't do any work to it. So they decided to build another distillery elsewhere where they had, they didn't have those uh, restrictions. And they, in 2013, 2011, they finished 
uh, building a distillery called Gravity Distillery. And uh, they named the whole area and uh, McMoyra Whiskey Village. Uh, they have a restaurant there, visitor center, distillery, and a um, maturation warehouse. Um, the very interesting thing about McMoyra is their maturation warehouse. They have eight of them, which is like crazy. And they're all scattered across Sweden and other countries as well. Um, I'll try to go through all of them if I can remember. So the first one, the main one is at Bodas Mine. They started using that as their main uh, maturation warehouse, I think from 2004. It's old iron ore mine, so you can see uh, iron iron facility, iron ore mine, it's all kind of in the area. So they've basically used the kind of dead industry and the remain the remnants of it and reused it in a different way, making whiskey, which is awesome. Uh, so Bodas mine goes 50 meters down. That's where they keep their barrels. Humidity is at 99% all year round. Temperatures are over six, seven degrees Celsius all year round. Probably has the lowest angels share ever. So the angels don't like uh, mines at all. It's at 1.5, 1.6% a year. So it's, they are not losing that much in that, uh, that mine, but obviously that brings up the maturation. Obviously it will take much longer to get the same effect as you would get above ground. Then they have a, a small warehouse on an island outside of Stockholm. And they have a small warehouse at the top of a mountain at a ski resort up north, Lundsvallen, I think it's called. I'm really sorry, Jakob, if I'm saying the names wrong, why well, I'm not Swedish. Uh, your name, your names are really hard, so please forgive me. He has already complimented you on your Swedish pronunciation. Good. So he'll be going against his words. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Um, McMoyer actually means small mosquito in old Swedish, uh, just as a, a nice touch. It, it was named after a village that was uh, the first distillery was based in, but the, the name of the distillery is means old mosquito, apparently, in old Swedish. So, uh, Steffi wants to know what barrels are involved in the whiskey. Yeah, so uh, I'll get into that. Um, yeah, so Bodas, small island off the coast of Stockholm. Uh, Another one up north in Lundsvallen. Uh, it's a ski resort, so obviously, ma like the mountains, I think are covered nearly all year round with snow, so it's quite cold. They have another uh, another warehouse at the coastal town in Smogen, which is very close to a border with Norway. One down south beside Malmo uh, in a castle. Another one beside a hotel at a lake. One in Germany. And then I was told as well that they're planning on having a maturation warehouse at a barge in Paris. So like really mad stuff and really scatter across all different parts of, uh, of Europe. And the great thing that they're doing is they're pairing up with hospitality businesses and basically they're using a little bit of space for the, the, the storing of the small barrels. And mainly the small barrels are, are used because obviously they don't take as much space and they can cram quite a lot into the small area. And they pair up with those businesses and usually the businesses uh, give a discount um, to customers that purchase a barrel. And if their barrel is in that warehouse or any other warehouse, they get a discount when they arrive to a hotel. Uh, so it's, it's really cool. Like, it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship between hospitality businesses and a company that wants to you know, give more choice to their reserve cask program customers to choose from all the different uh, maturation warehouses they have scattered across. So there's quite a lot to choose from and all those locations are unbelievable. Like, I mean, it's a tour in itself um, to literally uh, visit all those different places. Um, there isn't much known how the whiskey was made at Brook because that distillery isn't used anymore. Uh, it's now used as a, um, a craft gin distillery. They call it now Lab Plus, and they're making different spirits. They're now vodka, gins, and all sorts of different things. Uh, so it's still used. Um, the shape and the design of the stills are quite the same to gravity. Uh, so I'd imagine they're more or less the same. The only difference is I think the line arm on the on the spirit still is a different angle. Um, so this was a, a, a special series that they released. So there was, I think, 10 of them. This is number seven. Um, when they were initially uh, 
launching McMoira, they uh, were testing all the different distillates and the different um, different recipes that they had. They did over 170 runs up until they decided on main three distillates that they wanted to produce. So the first one was elegant and it's unpeated uh, malted barley. The second one was called smoky or rock in Swedish. And then the other one was called extra rock. So extra smoky or extra peated. They peat the barley themselves. They actually uh, reused an old shipping container and they've made it into a malting uh, house essentially. And when they smoke uh, the grains themselves, they use local turf, but they also add some juniper twigs into it as well, just to give it that unique scent, unique uh, flavor to it. So uh, I, I've never heard any other distillery adding some herbs and spices into, into the, the turf when they're smoking it. But yeah, I, I definitely can pick it up um they say it's a blend of elegant and smoky but i'm not getting as much smokiness in this and uh, there it is there quite a bit uh i'm not sure on the age is an on age statement i know that it is using uh cloudberry wine barrels so mm. like the fruit in itself a cloudberry like i think it's one of the prettiest prettiest berries you'll ever see like it looks like a, it looks like a like a fluffy clouds kind of pinky fluffy cloud and they can make wine out of it and that's um uh, that's the barrels that they used that previously held that wine i would imagine there's some ex bourbon there involved also uh, at some stage um but the finish was made in a, in a cloudberry wine barrel so yeah definitely something um something unusual it's at 45.8 percent um yeah Let's go into it. Like there is quite a good bit of sweetness in this. And it's like nearly like hard candy sweetness. Mm -hmm. Like um I wouldn't say wine gums, but that's the thing, there's so much sweetness on the actual nose itself, as opposed to being like Blindly sweet or sickly sweet. It's just so much sweetness on it that you don't really get much. Everything is extremely sweet. Then it gets to the palate, and there's a even though there's a ton of sweetness in it, yeah. there's enough spice in the background and enough kind of dryness in the background to carry it through. Yeah. And uh, again, that worlds was, apart. From the first yeah. Time. Exactly. Worlds apart. Completely mm -hmm. different style. As I was saying, the the they were dead. Mac Moira said that they were using both elegant and smoky, but. The smoky, I think, is very low quantities. Like I wouldn't say it was. If it's full maturation in the cloudberry wine, then you'd understand why there's so much sweetness, and maybe we're not getting that peat. The peat is just carrying it mm -hmm. out, and that's the dryness in the background. Or if it's bourbon barrels and it's the cloudberry, then there's just very, very little of that. Yeah, no, it, there wasn't. There was much information about. Uh, the aging and uh, maturation and uh, I, I know that there's cloudberry wine barrels involved but that's as far as uh, I as I was able to find uh, but yeah like I mean very interesting it's uh, something that you wouldn't you wouldn't get from and like you wouldn't get that kind of sweetness from any other maybe maybe so but I, I, I definitely haven't come across something with that kind of sweetness uh, from any finishes of any kind of wines. I haven't even tried cloudberry wine. I, I, was, I was kind of mad to get it even uh, just for the taste and just to see, can you pick up the different flavors? Maybe down the line, maybe maybe I will buy a bottle at some stage. I can't remember the last time I actually seen cloudberry wine. Now. Yeah, yeah, L really, like it's something something so uncommon. So yeah, it's kind of cool that they're really, you know, experimenting quite a lot, you know, with different maturation warehouses and, uh the different barrels that they can and uh, as i was saying the 30 liter barrels they can do quite a lot with that you know because it's such a small quantity that you really don't need much liquid to to keep them there uh, that's it the liquid to wood ratio the when you have a smaller cask you've less of an angel share because you have so much contact between the liquid and the wood that there's very little gap for actually air to get in for yeah the thing to circulate but yeah works works well it works well definitely like the, does and if the, the wine was in the small cask beforehand, um, you'd wonder how long it was in there to be that sweet and that much of an impact. Yeah. So their new distillery is uh, is quite unique as well. It's called Gravity for obvious reasons. 
it's based on an old military shooting range. Uh, this whiskey wasn't made in that day. This was bottled in autumn of 2011. So that comes from the old distillery. But the new distillery is, is quite unique. So as I was saying, there is gravity. So they bring uh, barley up to the top floor. That's where the process starts with your fermentation. And then, you know, the wort is then pumped down with very little effort to your stills. Then it's distilled and goes down and it's poured into the barrels. Uh, quite neat little system. They have like um, a petrol handle. So it looks like you're you're literally filling up your car, but you're filling up barrels with new make spirit. So it looks quite cool. They have a restaurant and they have another maturation warehouse right beside that distillery as well. So if you're ever uh, in around Gavel area, um, definitely go and visit. Um, I heard they have really nice food. And yeah, if you, if you want to uh, ad adopt barrel, they, they have quite a lot of choice. I had a little look on the site. Um, you can, you know, you can choose from different kind of liquids, different kind of barrel, uh, different kind of distillate. They're giving you a lot of options and, you know, different maturation sites scatter all across Europe. So uh, very cool project that they're doing, you know, and they've been, they've been there for quite a long time, you know, since 99. So uh, they are making a little bit more noise over time. Um, I think their master distiller got acquainted into the hall of fame the whiskey hall of fame not that long ago uh she's a woman by the way uh i think she has italian roots as well so uh she's doing a great job like i'm, I'm really loving this uh very sweet very light very easy to drink uh too easy even go a couple more sips in you got a lot more of a wood influence it starts to dry out a little bit give the world's smallest bit of spice but there's just so much sweetness at the start of it it's almost as if the rest of it doesn't exist yeah but after a little bit more, and a little super, bit more. super, super sweet. And this was likely aged in Bodas mine, I would mm. say. So obviously maybe the effect of bourbon is th that much tame because mm. of the maturation site as it is their, their main maturation site. I would imagine that's, that's where this was aged. Uh, obviously I, I'm, I'm not sure hundred percent, but now we have this since uh, uh, Jim got this into the Dylan back in 2011, I think if not 2012, um got two bottles in we actually still have one on the premises with a couple shots left in it but it's just one of those ones that nobody ever orders or thinks to order but when they do they're unbelievably surprised by it yeah yeah uh it, it's something yeah like i mean where 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 else would you get a cloudberry wine finish like i mean may, maybe so maybe we start a fad and uh irish distillers start buying clubberry wine barrels so anyone's doing it ceilings <laughs> anyone has it, <laughs> yeah they probably have everything yeah like i mean uh, what was the last mad one they did with the brazilian amber no that's amber uh amberana yeah amberana yeah oh they do like um them alone like when it comes to brazil they have cachaça woods they have brazilian not woods they have all different types like that they're great for it. They're, they use the place like a library. The only thing is they're more vocal about having so much as opposed to, you know, the rest of the big guys have it, but they're not as vocal. They, yeah, they're not they're, they're, they're not really saying it as much as, as others. Yeah, more for sure. I think that means when it's a surprise, it really is a surprise. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, what do we think so far, which is the favorite? Like, we're not halfway just yet, but I'm just kind of curious um, where do people think or this is sitting, which was your favorite so far? Uh, I don't know. I, I'd be between. I think I'd be between uh, Puni or McMoyra. I'm not too sure. Really hard to put a finger on this. Forty five point eight. There's so much sweetness in it. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah. Up that high. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So we'll probably move on. Hint of peanut butter. Hmm. Hint of peanut butter. Maybe. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe. Don't say they're wrong. <laughs> no one's ever wrong. <laughs> Don't eat them for John so far. Very good. Yeah, so uh, nice balance. Uh, like so people actually thinking that they're liking different things than I do. Because yeah, uh, so I'm drop, not always right. I'm dropping usually... from 45.8 to 42. So I wonder if this will make much of a difference. Yeah. Okay. So this is the hardware distillery. So this is in Hoodsport in the state of Washington. Uh, so rainy, it's uh, at the foot of Mount Olympus and it gets its water from the Hood Canal. Um, it was set up in 2012 by 
uh, semi-retired couple uh, called Chuck and Jan Morris. And they make all sorts of different things. It's not only whiskey. It's mainly that they're looking at is Aquavit, gin, um, distilled mead, mead, uh, all different things. So like they're, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny distillery. It's really um, like a shop front that, that was built in 1930s. Uh, used to be a hardware store and a grocery store over time. Uh, they bought the building in like 2011, 2012, obviously converted it into a distillery in about 18 months. There's a lot of things that they had to do, you know, for health and safety regulations. You know, when you're distilling and you have a volatile substance like alcohol, you have to have certain health and safety regulations. So it took them a little while, but they finally got there. Um, to make their whiskey, they asked for help from Mike Nicholson, which was, which is also semi-retired. Uh, he was a master distiller for various different distilleries that were under uh, Diageo umbrella. Uh, most notably, he was a dis master distiller in Lagavulin. Uh, so very famous brand. He's been working in whiskey industry for 36 years before he retired. You know, he's been inducted into the Hall of Fame himself. Uh, so very knowledgeable, knowledgeable guy. Uh, he now lives in Vancouver, so he kind of does little tours around that area, you know, a North US, Canada, and helping different distilleries setting up uh, their their whiskey production, you know, with his extensive expertise. So it's quite cool to see that he's still helping out smaller people with, with his knowledge, you know, he's passing it on further, uh, which is great. So he helped Jan and Chuck uh, to make this whiskey. Uh, they're making small batches. They have, I mean, tiny operations. Like you walk into a shop and they have three small stills, one is a small 10 liter, I think it's a 10 liter still, that's just like a desktop still, uh, probably for some experimentations. They have a hybrid still that's half copper, half stainless steel, and they have fully copper stainless steel. They're about 200, 300 liters in size, so tiny enough. Uh, they age the barrels then in the, in the basement of the distillery, again, Small barrels, they, they're probably not bigger than 50 to 125 liters in, in size. Uh, so very small operation. They don't produce as much. It, two semi-retired people, so, you know, they do as much as they feel like to, uh, and then running it that way, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know. Obviously, America is famous for making different kinds of whiskey, bourbons, rye, all that kind of stuff. So this is from a completely different side of the spectrum. No big... Uh, distilleries, no, uh, you know, huge budgets, nothing like that. It's just a, a, an older couple that just decided to put their love into a bottle, and um, yeah, that's the effect of their work. Um, just on your earlier question, uh, John and James are going for the Dunedin, and Noel is going for the McMara. He's uh, in love with the sweetness of it. So so far, Dunedin. Yep, McMara is very close, but. He's biased. I'll be biased later on, uh, Jakob, so don't worry. I'll be talking about uh, Polish Starka, so no, there'll be a, a lot of bias there. No, we're turning off the voice when it comes yeah, to you, that. Yeah, you better, you better <laughs> just, just shut yourself off it's because okay. I'm just going to blab on and blab on about... But anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there eventually. Um, but yeah. On the nose... Again, plums. I see on the nose a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. Plums. Yep. Plums, plums, and uh, uh, plums again. I can't get over the plums. Like kind conserve. Of, yeah, we're kind of more into an Armanac Calvados kind of a yeah. style nose as opposed yeah. to a, an American whiskey like we used to. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the barley is sourced locally, water is sourced locally, it's malted locally, everything is local. So everything from the area. They obviously they probably source from a very small time producers of barley and everything is sourced locally. They also uh, do peated whiskies as well and probably small quantities. Uh, I've seen them cooking it with oysters or something like that, so it's quite unique as well. But they also I think they also source some malted barley from Scotland, like peated malted barley from Scotland, just seems to be the main consensus with uh, with small producers. Uh, John is going for dried papaya on this dried one. Dried papaya. Mm. Like 
again, yeah, John, you're right. It's uh, very different to Irish whiskies. Like each one of them so far was completely different to one another. Like it was really like tasting different liqueurs. Um, that's why that's why we did this taste, and we wanted to show that how much extra is out there. You know, with all the different producers that you know use so many different methods and different casks, like, like the Cloudberry beforehand, and uh, you know. Um, even different grains from different countries. Obviously, the um, the climate will be slightly different, so that will affect uh, the raw ingredients as well. So you know, you're getting a slice off of the region, really, especially with this, where everything is local. Well, that's it. Like with Ireland, Scotland, and America, we all, we know that everyone's bound by a long list of rules. And as we were talking the last day about Japan, it can be fast and loose, or it can be strict rules depending on which side yeah. that they're sitting. But with these, they're in their own countries. They're making not making it up as they go along, but over the course of a smaller period of time that they've been making it, they set their own rules of length of time they're doing, what types of casks, and it's a lot shorter of a list of what we would have to stick to. Yeah, than what they have to. There's stick far to. more. There's far more expertise, obviously, in in Ireland, Scotland, and whatever. Um, and even the climates, as you were saying, they're, they're very high climates in some of them, and then they're cheating, so to speak, with the, the bunkers and below ground. Yeah, exactly. They're, yeah. They're, they're controlling it. To, like if they went to Scotland, if they went to Ireland to learn, and then they're trying to mimic something from Ireland or Scotland, if you're sticking it underground, you're closer to an Irish Scottish climate where we were kind of in between five and 15 degrees every single year. We do go a little less, we do go a little more, but majority of the time, we're yeah. in a, a centre ground. Yeah, like, I mean, the, the last time we when we went to Middleton, I remember, I think it was, like, the hottest day in, like, the history of Ireland. We were melting on the bus, and we walked into the warehouse. It was nice and cool. Uh, but, yeah, they, they didn't, usually there isn't much of a fluctuation in temperature here. It was, like, as we were saying in Italy, 40 degrees is substantial. Like, it's substantial. And um, I think, um, sorry, Washington is closer to Ireland. It's quite rainy, it's quite mm. damp, um, so be closer to that. And they were storing it in their small basement down uh, below the distillery. So very, as I said, it's a very small operation. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm blown away. I honestly, I was I was expecting the least out of this, and it surprised me the most. I think out of all of them, I'd be like, I'm interested to know if this is following the whole American thing of. It's a virgin American white oak for the first time because it's not coming across as that over charred vanilla caramel. Nearly every single American whiskey that you try in some way, shape or form has that over yeah. American white yeah. oak aspect to it. Before Very you woody, it's like yeah, taking a, a bite of a, a stave really. Mm. And even though there's a, a lot of dryness on the roof of your mouth, there's a creaminess to it and a sweetness to it that I wouldn't associate with the majority of the bourbons yeah. and ryes that we... Who yeah, usually come um, I, I, I'm not sure about the barrels. The, as I was saying, there was very, very, very little information about the distillery in itself. I, I, I just seen like one or two videos and they're kind of showing around how they make bits and bobs uh, down there. So the barrels looked like it was American white oak, but mm. I'm just judging from a video. So I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly if it was American white oak or was it something else. Um, but yeah, on the palate, you're like getting like this this milk chocolate mm. kind of note. Very sweet, very sweet. Like, very sweet. Like even like li liqueur kind of sweetness to it. Mm. But there is a slight bitterness to it as well. But it, it's kind of very, very faint and it decimates mm -hmm. very quickly. So it, it disappears uh, quite soon. So um, um, yeah. Um, it's different. It's definitely different from most from most of them. Yeah, whatever the cask influence is, it's very distinct. There is um the nose on it is, as John was saying, with your drive by the nose on it is a lot more kind of dry tropical fruit. Your um, you can almost tell it's going to be creamy, but on the palate that that milk chocolate dud, and then very strange dry spice. I can't actually put my finger on what the dry spice that I'm getting from it is. I'm just thinking, since they're making different liqueurs as well, mm. such as I mean, distilled mead and mead, I wonder, did they reuse some of the barrels and put some whiskey in those barrels? 
-hmm. after they've used it and that's why you're getting this huge amount of sweetness and huge amount of different kind of weird spices that we're not accustomed to maybe so like I, I i i think that'd be the best guess i would say that they're reusing some of the the barrels that they used for different products um they 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 experiment quite a lot so it could be uh one of the barrels that was an experimentation of, of some sort and maybe there was some distilled mead in it or any of or some fruit uh fruit liqueur uh that they've produced and it was just reused um later on for whiskey and um, so yeah no um weird but surprising mm -hmm. at the same time you know not weird not in a bad way in any way shape or form it's it's very interesting it's just something that you 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 weren't expecting from the whiskey from america mm -hmm. you know yep. very likely being white american oak and Fluffy has made a good point there potentially garyana garyana is a type of kind of like oregon um oregon oak it's like a mountain oak um, oh, okay. You know, uh, okay. Teeling's recently had a chinkapin. Chinkapin's another yeah, type yeah, of yeah, oak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the chinkapin is extremely uh, nutmeg, cinnamon. It's very spice forward. Whereas the Garyana is more it's almost like a Brazilian palm tree kind of a. You'd expect it to be tropical. Okay. Um, yeah. I, so I, that is a huge possibility. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it like it's it's quite possible. I mean, this is a a, a big kind of question mark because as I was saying there wasn't much info about it and all of all the info is really from the videos that I've seen online there isn't much there otherwise but yeah I think uh, what what he was saying is probably a, a good shout uh, also most that's right because like a technically the rule is American white oak and majority of the time you get the same species that we're used to doing because um it's this pretty much the same factories that are producing every yeah. single cast that come yeah. across the world. Majority of what we will get will always be Jack Daniels, Woodford, etc. But um yeah, it is a, a huge thing when you go towards the the Rocky Mountains, when you go towards Oregon itself and you go closer to Canada, you get um American white oak, but a different species of it. And they add way different flavors. Like same with your dark whale talk. Uh, yeah, serious, you know, and um, the whole green cells would knock raft forest. Well, that's it. The, the Irish oak and the European oak, is, some of it is technically the exact same wood variety, but in Spain, hotter climate, tighter grain, Ireland, better climate, more porous. Yeah. So I'll actually find it. Then um, John's going for Cadbury fruit and nut bars. And uh, was it? Connor's just going for roller coaster flavor start to finish. It really is, yeah. yeah. The, n the nose does not tell the story of the palate, no. nor does it go the other way around. But um, as soon as you think it's dry, there's sweetness. As soon as you think yeah. it's sweetness, there's a, a bitterness. It really, it really is throwing you off. It's just dancing on your tongue and dancing on your palate, and you really can't pick up because it changes so quickly, in and out, in and out. Uh, so, yeah, very interesting. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to find out a little bit more about it if I can. If I do, by any chance, I, I'll let you all know. But, yeah, I, I wasn't able to get in contact with them, and... Obviously, for COVID-wise and all, and you know, it's a it's a semi-retired couple. I do understand that um, the, the climate isn't right for talking to people at the moment. So as soon as it lifts, straight over, knock on the door. Yeah, uh, way, yeah. exactly. Yeah, if if we could do the tour of all these distilleries or all these places, it would be fantastic. We'd have some trip. Uh, anyway, um, Carol wants to know where you sourced the bottle from and if it is available say in Ireland, Europe, or... I got it at an auction a very long time ago. It was at a Scotch whiskey auction. Scotch whiskey. .com. Wait until Brexit lowers it. <laughs> yeah. the duty is not worth it. Uh, they, uh, they, it, popped, it popped up on, on one of the auction sites. I was picking up along with uh, other bottles. It was just... Uh, I didn't pay uh, an awful lot for it. It was, it was kind of... I bundled it up just so it's a card filler. You're you're paying yeah. 15, 20, 25 quid to get everything to it, so you add another item. It yeah, really it, it was at the right price at that time at an auction, and I just filled it up just to you know cut down on the cost of delivery essentially. And that's what I got it was purely by accident. I didn't even know I wanted to be honest. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just like because you're bidding, then you you end up you know going into that bidding fever, and then you don't realize what you've won or what you didn't win. And that was one of those bottles that I ended up winning without even knowing. But speaking of things that you weren't expecting, we're already at the halfway point. So yeah, if everybody wants to take a five-minute piddle break, yeah, we'll take it. We'll take water. we'll take five. We'll refill mm -hmm. some waters, and we'll be back to you shortly. So yeah, take five, and yeah, we'll be back to you shortly.
Okay, so we are back uh, yes. after a short break. Um, hope you did your business and we can <laughs> go back to taste. And so, yeah, we'll move on to Amarut whiskey this time. Um, halfway across the globe yet again. Halfway across the globe. This is uh, India we're in this time. Um, so, the company was set up in 1948 uh, by a man called Mr. Jack Daly. That's his surname. I'm not pronouncing his name because it's too long and too damn complicated, so I'm not even going there. Um, initially, it was a chemical analysis company, and then 20 years later, in around there, they decided to start producing alcohol. Uh, initially, they produced uh, brandies, different fruit brandies, schnapses, vodkas, gins, rum, uh, and that's that's where they started. Um, but over time, the the the, the world began in kind of introducing whiskey into the portfolio of the company. Then, uh, likely, they started distilling whiskey in 1987. They said it was in the 80s, but I would imagine it's in 1987. That's when they've built their distillery, which they're using today, which is in the Karnataka region in India. Um, at the time, they weren't making whiskey, like proper whiskey. They are making whiskey mixed with uh, distilled spirit from molasses and from uh, barley. So you couldn't call it whiskey in Europe or anything like that. So it was made for the local market. And it wasn't really whiskey. It was kind of an am amalgamation of rum and whiskey together. And they were selling as whiskey. The two brands that they were selling at the time was, I think they're still producing till today it's called prestige and then macintosh and they were suppliers for the indian army as well as the local region like india is quite big so like a local region is big as well but the whole country is even bigger and um, so that's why you'd say locally supplied even though the local area could be bigger than ireland so it's it's quite popular and um, obviously they didn't have any issues selling you know the like imitation whiskies at the time because they were you know, feeding uh, the Indian Army and the local populace, so there wasn't any issues. But um, they wanted them to move into like a premium single malt market as well. Uh, they 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 thought that they could make good enough spirit to compete with other uh, producers worldwide. Um, so they started producing single malt whiskey in 1997. Um, the son of the second owner, which was, he basically took over the distillery after his father, which set up the company, died. And then his son went over to UK to study. And in 2001, he his father sent him uh, samples of the whiskey that they've made in India. Uh, the son's name is uh, Rakshit, or Rick, they call him. And the father's name is Neil, I think. I'm not sure. Like it's it's really hard to pronounce Indian names. I'm really sorry. Um, but yeah, Neil sent samples to Rakshit, and then Rakshit basically uh, went over to different um, bars and restaurants and did, did a couple of blind tastings in UK while he was studying there. He actually did his uh, dissertation or his thesis on uh, premium single malt whiskies and how to approach the market. He he studied marketing, I think, and he was trying to uh, do thesis about starting a new company and how do you approach to market uh, the product so in 2001 he was uh, entering into like blind tastings and they were getting really good response from different um, whiskey aficionados in uk and you know obviously they're uplifted that they thought that you know their products can compete with with scottish whiskies and etc so they decided to launch a, a new product line called the amroot amroot is in, in Sanskrit is ne called Nectar of Gods. That's what Amrut means in Sanskrit. Um, they launched it in Edinburgh in 2004. Uh, initially, they got really good response. People loved the whiskey. Um, it, it was all great, but it didn't translate into sales. Uh, and I, I don't see, you know, I, I, it's not hard to imagine why. Like, I mean, it's uh, entering a UK market where there is such an abundance of fantastic distilleries and fantastic whiskies. It was really ballsy, like, I mean, really ballsy trying to enter with uh, a whiskey from a country that's not 
known for making good whiskey. So it was a really hard sell, both for suppliers and customers alike. So they're struggling for a few years. And the owner of the company, Neil, Neil Jack Daly, wanted to put a, pull a plug on it after two years, but his son, Rakshit, which, you know, helped to do the market research, advised him not to give it a little bit more time because he feels that uh, this kind of market is very hard to get into and it really takes a lot a long time to build that customer trust and that customer base that they would you know be happy to uh, part with their money and buy a bottle of Indian whiskey um, and then in late 2000s they start receiving more awards and obviously more awards usually uh, uh, translate to more sales and then you know more people try it more people talk about it then it grows over time and if if it wasn't successful it wouldn't be there because as i was saying he they were trying to pull a plug on it already uh, after two years so uh, it must be doing well and they've they've been winning awards left right and center for different products they're doing quite a lot of different things uh, as well the production is quite manual like there's a lot of uh, manual labor involved obviously cost of uh, labor is much 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 lower than anywhere in the world because it's india so they they do use quite a lot of manual labor um since india is quite a tropical country with a tropical climate uh the fermentation in itself it has to be very strictly controlled when it comes to temperature so uh, the temperature is quite low for fermentation at 15 degrees, but I'd imagine it's slightly like they 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 control the the, the fermentation tank at 15 percent uh, 15 degrees, but the temperature of the air could could be like 45 degrees, so it's probably a little bit higher. But they're bringing it down slightly lower because they know that the counterbalance of hot air in the in the room is is probably going to bring the temperature up slightly. Uh, they use a six row barley rather than the other types of barley. Uh, six row barley has smaller grains, but also it's a little bit more pungent. Um, they get it from the northern regions of India, like the Punjab and Rajasthan, and it's at the foothills of Himalayas. So that's where they get their malted barley. Uh, if they're using peated barley for some of the other whiskies that they have on the portfolio, and uh, they source it from Scotland, and I think that's a common uh, kind of consensus of if they're using multi peated barley, they'll outsource it from Scotland because they know the best how to do it correctly. And um, so that's quite common. And uh, they use double distillation process. Um, initially, they had pro the, the, the reason why they didn't start making whiskey earlier was the fact that they couldn't source the right equipment. So that's why they didn't start making whiskey till 97. Uh, because they couldn't get the right angle. Eventually, they did. Um, so any uh, Amarut whiskey is made in uh, copper pot stills. They do have column still as well, but they are using it for different products. So everything is made in copper pot stills. Uh, three stills. I think they're only using two. Uh, so they have a, a small wash still. I think it's at 6,500 liters. Uh, it's uh, more of a pear-shaped with quite a wide neck, and then it kind of uh, narrows down to the top. Uh, the spirit still is much bigger. It's at 9,000 liters, and it has a much different shape. So there's a quite a big constrictions in between the pot in itself and the neck, and then the neck widens quite dramatically after it's connected to the pot. It's like a shape of a lamp, you know, like a conical lamp, that kind of shape. Um, and they say that the, the shape helps with better interaction of copper and obviously the vapor. Um, makes it uh, obviously much cleaner uh, after that they uh, when they go to maturation they predominantly use ex bourbon casks uh, they seem to be dismantled uh, rebuilding them they're usually dismantled bourbon casks and then they re uh, re, uh, dis re what am i saying um they recoup them and put them into shape and uh, then they uh, char them into the deep alligator char. Um, I would say that's because the barrels that they're getting were used quite much more than any other ones. Obviously, I would imagine that uh, the budget from an Indian company is a little bit lower, so they can't get 
the super super premium super fresh cast so they they kind of maybe have to settle on uh, you know second or third fill uh, bourbon casks but they are doing a quite a nice jar and they're putting a lot of time and effort into making the barrels uh, quite good you know it's all hands-on the guys uh, are doing a fantastic job there's a couple of videos of of them uh, working on the barrels so it's quite unique obviously they they use all sorts of uh, different barrels as well x rum that they probably make x madeira marsala um irish scotch whiskey barrels whatnot they're they're using them they're using quite a wide variety there's uh, quite a good choice of different limited editions uh, out there um i couldn't tell you about these days but the story in the late 90s early 90s was uh, they were using their ex rum casks which would be like bourbon to irish or scotland then across to rum and then back that's the reason why they had to scrape them down and to get them from the countries across, you're going from a high climate to a high climate. So, so the wood's very dried out. Yeah. So you would have to rechar it to make sure you can actually get the liquid in there. Yeah. I, I can't speak about the last like 10, 15 years, but originally in the late nineties, early nineties, it was. Yeah. It was I, yeah. I would, I would imagine, I would imagine that's correct because uh, you could see in some of the videos that, you know, the, the barrels were quite deeply charred um, and some of them were dismantled or, you know, put together. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with reusing the barrels as much as, you know, it gives off the flavor that you're happy with, you're happy with the profile. There's nothing wrong, like, I mean, uh, Bushmills and, G and Middleton, they use, you know, third fill, fourth fill at mm -hmm. some stages as well. So it's it's not uncommon. It's just we, we're we we're used to, you know, always seeing first fill bourbon, at most second fill. You know, they don't really advertise the third fill or the fourth fills, but some distillers do use them it's it's not uncommon practice um yeah since it's in the tropical climate obviously the angel share is massive and i mean massive uh first year is 12 percent and then the consecutive years is 10 percent. so i mean this whiskey doesn't need much uh the climate is so violent so tropical so it has a, such a big effect on, on on the angel share that you know it doesn't really need a lot of time uh, to get the similar effect and you know using uh, barrels that uh, had a bigger use out of them uh, obviously kind of helps to soften them I, I couldn't possibly imagine having like a virgin oak aged in there like uh, it'd probably be overwhelming to to taste even um, so yeah the, the, the probably the reuse the reuse barrels works much better with their climate as well um so it's finished in ex madeira casks and this limited edition was uh there was a 4800 bottle run everything is hand labeled handmade like they even check uh they check the bottles and the clarity of the liquid inside uh, by by women so they'll sit down in like a front of a white screen lit up and they'll flip every bottle upside down and they see if there's any sediment or anything like that all labels are hand uh, put on the bottles everything is hand corked there's very little automation so it's really really a hands-on operation well you can imagine in that high of a climate if you're bottling if the, the place doesn't have air conditioning or anything like that um if you're going to have a, a chill filtration or non-chill filtration you could end up getting a taint in the liquid very very quickly in those kind of regards yeah or the heat itself if the liquid goes to expand you can pop corks and stuff like that again. exactly uh, it, they are air conditioned. Uh, the the bottling facility definitely is air conditioned. Um, but uh, yeah, still, like I mean, a, a, a tropical climate like that definitely is a challenge to make a, make a whiskey. You know, with your fermentation and your maturation and bottling, you're you you're losing quite a lot, and it's a little bit harder to control rather than you know in here when everything is so mild. Um, so a lot of work is involved, you know, to to get the product right. It's not easy in a climate like that. Uh, to make whiskey so um props to them for you know doing a really good job and you know they they have been winning awards and uh people do appreciate what they're doing um so you've got jonathan dropping in there with tropical fruits on the nose he's got mango honey and weirdly rose water rose water i see where you're coming from like i'm getting like this um not menthol but like um like fresh some like some sort of like a fresh pungent herb and like, yeah, I can't get okay. um and getting kind of like a phenol sherry kind of nuttiness 
um, eucalyptus leaves when it comes eucalyptus. to that kind of hmm. kind of freshness. Then um, I can see where he's going with the rose water. It's not as pungent as rose water for me, but I can see where he's going with that. Um, mango, yeah, lots of tropical fruits. Uh, on the nose, it's a lot more hinting and telling you there's sherry involved. On the palate, it's that drier, nuttier kind of style that you would usually get from sherry. Yeah. Almost a port palate without the dark fruits, that kind of dry. Yeah, nutty. yeah, I, I see what you mean. You're again, that that kind of dryness. Uh, uh, this is actually bottled at fifty percent, so it's a little a little bit stronger as well. So the flavors maybe a little bit more profound. I'd say, uh, adding a bit of drop of water could help it as well. Kind of dissect the flavors a little bit more. But Steffi's yeah. wondering if anybody gets fennel. Hmm. Yeah, as I was saying, it's like this weird herbal note. Like it, mm. it, it could be that, that 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 like I'm like I'm not getting menthol, but like I'm getting like this f freshness or like this. I don't know. It's really hard to put, put hard to put a finger on it. It's quite funny, like when you're saying fennel. So if uh, if you're tasting licorice, licorice obviously has a, a very licorice flavor. Um, fennel usually comes across more like oily than licorice yeah so you do get that kind of um menthol warmth menthol kind of coating um i can see where she's coming from that one uh with john john is saying uh he's got palate honey um fruit jam and then wood yeah. appearing near the end fruit awesome jam. sip fruit jam okay uh, like uh, uh, on the palate it reminds me of uh, dehydrated oranges a little bit mm. like um that slight bitter note of the skin and then that huge kind of punch of uh sweet and sour citrus notes coming through straight after that that's what i'm kind of getting uh on the palate initially and then the sweetness is kind of building up slowly but surely um, yeah, i'm getting the yeah, the sweetness of fruit jam i can see that but uh the bitterness would be more you know when you're steeping uh, figs, dates, and stuff like that in mm -hmm. alcohol, and then if you go to eat the fruit afterwards, that kind of yeah, bitter, okay. Yeah, that's where I'm getting kind of bitterness. From. Okay. Um, like you're after pulling yeah. the sweetness out, so the sweetness is on the nose, but it's re kind of replaced with alcohol, yeah. and then you just left yeah, with that the kind alcoholic of... fruit afterwards. If you're if you're making a a whiskey marmalade or if you're making um, a brandy and plum jam, you're getting the sweetness of the fruits, but you're getting that alcoholic bite that dries it off and makes it kind of like bitter. Mm -hmm. Ben Lucy, favorite so far, orchard fruits, big time, and um, root fusion, maybe. Next, Next day is ah, yeah. Fusion, yeah, that's a, that's a cracking one. I haven't had that. I'd say in about five or six years, that's really good. Um, when Amarut does peach, they usually, again, they go high alcohol, 50% yeah. in the round, and they usually have a, a high portion of, they either have a high portion of port fortified wines, or because of the climate, there's a high impact of those. Port you don't really need much but when a short do, finish yeah, but when they is. do the peat it's like slight peat on the nose loads of peat in the middle um tons of fortified wine coming through it and it's very interesting but this as the base kind of distillate that they're using the base malt itself really does interact very well you're getting sweetness but not too much you're getting bitterness not too much you're getting spice not too much it's really kind of intermingling um yeah um they, I, yeah, actually when i was obviously tasting it initially setting up the um uh, the, the sequence yeah the order um it wasn't jumping out at me but today for some reason after you know sitting down and talking mm -hmm. through all of them it's wow it jumped at me quite a lot more than the last time i remembered and it's it's it's, it's really lingering then uh, at the back uh really nice very well rounded flavors uh, i like the influence of the madeira it's not overly whiny per se but it, it adds like that, that kind of nice um uh wine influence to it but it, it's not as uh, as profound as i thought it was going to be I mean, like it just plays so nicely with the rest it's it's very well balanced and so with Madeira, you usually get a, a dry, extremely floral kind of side of fortified wine. Yeah. And then with Jerry, you get more of that nuttiness. And with Port, you get more dry. You do get nutty, but it's more kind of 
berries and nuts than anything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More berries than nuts. This feels more like a uh, Athena and Amontillado going into an Oloroso as opposed to going towards that Madeira, Marsala, that kind of sweeter yeah. influence. Yeah, definitely, definitely not, uh, not a sweet influence there. It's more kind of drier and yeah. But that can come down to, as you say, in the scraping of the barrels, you're going to have a load of wood impact and then um, the climate itself and then the the distillates themselves aren't what we would be used to so they could be a complete different style of um of a single malt we're used to more orchard fruits in our single malts um on the island so far and yeah. then going across to scotland the non-peated ones again a good bit of orchard fruits um your glenfiddich for instance with big pear, yeah, your yeah. Bush pear, with big yeah, apple. pear apple yeah whereas over here if we were to try to distill it on its own even though we're getting orchard fruits from this and a good few people are getting it as well it's not the same style as what we're used to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, interesting. Smash and dram. Yeah, really nice. Uh, really, really nice. And then uh, Mel Conley Amarut so far is winning for her out of the five. Good stuff. See if we can sway you with six and seven, but uh, Adrian will definitely try sway you with six. But uh, we'll um, see if we can. Well, sway I, you with I'm six as and biased seven. as it gets to this taste, and I'm really sorry. But there's only one winner. I'm one clear. No, winner, sorry, so. John is already saying Starka has some competition. That's <laughs> already in the build up now. He uh, may have actually screwed himself by putting this fifth before number <laughs> uh, before number six. But um, yeah, we will see where. I, I still won't listen to any of you because I think I think Stark is the best. But I, I'm I'm very biased, and I'm already saying I'm sorry because <laughs> I'm really absolutely biased. Okay, so John is saying, could it be the six row barley itself? Lots more protein. So uh, six row barley. Um, if one well, of the only thing that strikes to mind is Finlandia with six row barley. That that. I can't think of anything else that specifically uses six row and only six row. So uh, Finland, Scandinavia, that kind of area gets a lot of sunlight. And the same as India, you need more sunlight during your day and basically no winters, no um, darkness for six row barley to thrive. That's why it's smaller and tighter. Okay. It's got a lot more sugars in it. Um, so it really does thrive in India. But yeah, the, the proteins, I can see where you're coming from with that one. Um, you're talking earlier on about unmalted barley mm -hmm. and getting a very low yield because these are smaller, tighter, and got a lot more sugars per surface area. Yeah, it's going to give off a lot more of an impact in the the fermentation itself straight away. Absolutely. Yeah. And Dragos is loving the fifth as well. Yeah. No, the fifth so far seems to be the the crowd favorite anyway. That'll change very quickly now, yeah, lads. I tell you. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. We'll uh, shall we move on to the pista resistance for me anyway. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I, I pretty much this was for me. This was the the whole point of this taste, and I just wanted to try this. Like I'm, uh, I, I like I'm not gonna lie. I'm completely biased, completely uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, more than a couple of reasons actually. Uh, this is actually produced in the town in the city called Szczecin, which I'm very close from. I live about 50 miles away. I How's used your to. Polish pronunciations? <sighs> they were better. They were better. <laughs> They're not as good anymore, but they, they are better. I, I, I practiced a little bit like I practiced my Swedish as well. Yeah, so. We must admit the Japanese pronunciations, even though you're taking <laughs> yourself down, you did very, very well. But yeah, oh my God. your Polish ones to be on point. It's been a while since you've been there. It's probably. been a while. It's been a while, but I'll do my best. I'll try. I'll try to. I'll try to. Um... Like even your star pam and your pill bagging in the house. It's not Polish prints <laughs> and it's not Polish water. Oh, stop. Stop. <laughs> anyway. So obviously I'm going to blab on about a lot of history here. So uh, communism. Communism. Well, uh, <laughs> even before communism, I'm going 500 years before communism, I'm going that far. Um, so yeah, Starka, that's how you call it, Starka, not Starka, Starka. Um, it's, the legend starts to appear in Polish literature in kind of 15th, 16th century, um, as you know, there's a big row between Russia and Poland is who invented vodka first. Poles say it was Poland. Russians say it was Russia. Uh, you'll Russia. never get solved. Just forget about it. I'm obviously I'll say it's Poland because I have to. 
I have no other choice. It's written in your passport. That's what you have to say. You know, I've solved the Irish versus Scottish. You have to solve the. <laughs> well, there you go. Irish. Exactly. Yeah, it's the same story. Um, so yeah, the first kind of things uh, about uh, distilling start appearing in uh, Polish literature in 15th, 16th century. Um, that's what apparently when the first time vodka uh, was mentioned in literature, it was in Poland. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not getting into the argument now. Um, so. Uh, the word starka, uh, basically, there's a couple of different uh, ways of uh, looking at the name. Uh, Poland was uh, uh, was uh, formed uh, formed a union back in 16th century with Lithuania, so it was a Polish and Lithuanian Commonwealth, and both countries uh, produced starka, and both countries have different. Uh, a different story behind the name, how it originated. So, uh, in Poland, it's uh, down to two. It, uh, there's two ways you can you can dissect it. Uh, the first way would be saying that starka is uh, from the world from the word uh, old, which is stare. And if you call a liquid old, you could call it staruszka or or, or uh, stare stare uh, alcohol. Uh, and that's where the name originated. Uh, the other way of looking at it is uh, two words. So you have uh, stare, which is old, and then vodka, which is vodka. And then if you take the start of the the, the, the old and then the end of vodka, you'll get starka. And that's where the name apparently originated. So you amalgamation of two words, vodka and, and old, and you get starka. Uh, in Lithuania, they look at that a different way. Uh, they say they call it Starkus rather than Starka, and Starkus is a uh, stork. It's, uh, it's after a bird, mm. and they named it after a bird. And that's uh, where babies come from. And that's the first of all kinds. Of yeah, so yeah, a, a stork would bring you a bottle of Starka or something like that. I don't know. Maybe that's the way it's going. But anyway, so you celebrate every baby with its head with a bottle of Starka. Exactly. And um, well, I, I was actually getting on that. So the story goes there's a big marketing uh, story behind Starka itself, uh, which is absolute BS, by the way. Um, so back in the old days, when the noble's uh, son was born, they distilled dry distillate, they poured it into a barrel, and that barrel then was buried underground until that son was uh, was uh, getting married and then the barrel was being dug out and drank during wedding festivities Ugh. all bullshit because who in the right mind will bury a barrel in the ground it will leak everywhere it will leak, you'll be left with absolutely nothing so it's an absolute marketing ploy don't believe what they're saying to you uh, they're saying that they had to bury it underground because uh, polish nobility wasn't able to get their hands off uh, alcohol and they would drink it before he even got older so that's why they apparently buried it but uh you could actually uh, get polish nobles a little bit more credit because they're quite restrained when it comes to starka and they weren't drinking it in the bucket loads and they're actually letting it age quite significantly um so in the, the kind of the 17th 18th century it's seen um a lot more starka being produced. Usually it's produced by nobility. So nobles obviously will have a big estate and he'd produce uh, a roy distillate uh, of some sort and then put it in a barrel. And the reason why they use uh, roy distillate because uh, it was quite common, it still is quite common that roy is grown in this area, uh, both Lithuania and in Poland. And that's what they've used as the most common grain and they are most, most accustomed to it. Uh, obviously, you have example like your Belvedere, it's made out of rye as well. Um, um, they were aging it in, so yeah, there's two things. So two things would make Starka, Starka. So it's the rye distillate and then the barrels that they've used. Uh, usually they've used barrels out of Hungary, so sweet wines, Tokoy wines. Uh, that's what they, was, uh, they were using uh, most commonly. There is a very famous uh, Polish saying, which I'm going to uh, first say it in Polish. So, Polak i węgiel dwa bratanki i do szabelki i do szklanki. Which ah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Which means a Pole and a Hungarian uh, are like two brothers, both for the sabre and the glass. So, Pole and Hungarian, 
quite crazy. They like to fight, but they also like to drink. So they're like brothers. So the whole relationship between Poland and Hung Hungary is quite famous. It's like everyone in Poland is saying, oh, you know, you're Hungarian, you're my brother, la, la, la. So that was the same story when they were making Starka. They, they loved uh, fortified wines from Hungary and sweet wines. Um, so they were getting, obviously, back in the day, bar uh, wine would be shipped in barrels. And then when you empty the barrel out, you left with an empty barrel. What, we did, what would you do? You put some rye distillate in it that they made quite commonly. And that's how they aged. And that's uh, where, where the whole style of Starka um, originated. Technically, it's a, it's a rye whiskey aged dry whiskey in a fortified wine barrel um but in poland if you say rye whiskey polish rye whiskey no one would know what you're talking about starka is starka in poland there's no other other way of uh, uh, explaining it it's just starka there's nothing else uh, that can com uh, like compare to it in the eyes of poles obviously um in 1795 poland was partitioned off so it actually didn't exist on the map up until at the end of first world war um so we were partitioned off for uh, so part of poland was owned by germany part was by austria and another part by russia so yeah all our best friends um but the the tradition didn't die uh there is a lot of chronicles from different people saying that uh they have there was a, one in particular in 1856, there was a doctor that visited um, an old Polish noble that was living in parts of Lithuania at the time. And he invited them into this small uh, um, stone house where he had uh, barrels of fortified Hungarian wine and obviously some Starka as well. And one barrel actually, uh, that he was tasting uh, had the date of 1806 on it. So when he was tasting in 1856, it was 50 years old already. So uh, the tradition uh, was quite prevalent by Polish nobles. Um, in middle uh, 19th to 20th century, uh, distilling companies uh, started making their own versions and they actually advertised it as rye cognac rather than whiskey. Um, and that they were saying that that like it's like it's like Polish cognac essentially. Um, most notably, uh, it was the Bachevsky company from Lviv, which was making their own version of Starka, and they actually advertised it as rye cognac. There's uh, certain newspaper clippings from that time that actually showed bottles of Starka uh, advertised as rye cognac. Um, so that's how it was made before First World War. Obviously, that wasn't Poland was in the country then. And then in 1918, we gained back our independence and Starka obviously reappeared once again. But the way it reappeared after in the between war times, so between first war, after the first world war and before second world war was, um, was different to what it was made back in the noble times. So after the first world world war, uh, Polish nobility got absolutely skinned and robbed. Uh, they, they've taken their estates, they've taken their alcohols. Um, basically, you know, they, they, they're trying to kind of vanquish the nobility of, of Poland in, in uh, the 20th century. Uh, so a lot of that history and the heritage of Starka was also lost with that. Um, in between the wars, the way they were making it, it was a little bit more of a imitation so there again, a low grade potato distillate mixing with rye distillate, adding tea leaves, tree leaves, oak shavings, whatever they had up in, uh, in you know, within their vicinity to kind of imitate the flavor. Um, some companies were making it traditional way, you know, proper rye distillate, putting in uh, fortified wine barrels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but they're too few, too scarce. And then Second World War came, and then you know all the atrocities that happened in Poland and other countries. Uh, obviously, we felt quite a bit. A lot of fighting went through Poland. Um, a lot of my family was involved on both fronts. You know, fighting against the Germans and all that. So yeah, it's um, um, it, it took quite some time for the country to recover. Um, and after the war, basically, the third act of history of Starka happens. So when 
Second World War finish, all the bo Polish borders moved westwards. So we lost quite a bit of territories in the east and we gained quite a bit of territories in the west. But the, the main area where Starka was made was actually in the east. So the regions that we've lost, uh, for example, cities like Lviv, um, Vilnius, which is obviously the capital city of Lithuania now, a lot of Poles associated with making Starka were from there. So a lot of that was lost yet again to another war. And when we gained territories in the in the West, the uh, city of Szczecin was one of them where this is made. And after the war, obviously, a lot of people were moved from east side of Poland to the west side of Poland to translate them over, move them over to uh, new territories, either by force or not by force. The operation was called Operation Vistula. Uh, after the main river, and over 150 Polish Ukrainians were moved forcibly to west western parts of Poland, mainly the uh, the coast. And my family was actually involved in one of those moves. My grandfather was moved uh, during those times, and a lot of those people actually settled in Szczecin. So some of them actually had experience in making Starka, and that's why they decided to put it there. But not only. Uh, why? Um, so the building of the distillery in itself, where uh, this is uh, this was made, was uh, an old brewery and an old winemaking facility. And obviously, that before the war, that was uh, owned by Germany. So the uh, building was built in 1863, and it was a, called Brewery Victoria. And 10 years later, they built the famous uh, cellars that are beneath uh, the distillery. And the, the, the brewery at the time was working up until 1917 uh, when uh, supply shortages because of First World War, uh, obviously they had to close it down and um, cease production. Uh, after First World War, uh, another company took over the distillery and named it CW Kemp and they started making schnapps for the fried wine, vodkas, etc. They used uh, the famous sellers for obviously maturation and uh, keeping some of the stock and also storing some big blocks of ice uh, as well. And then when Second World War was coming close to Szczecin, they evacuated whatever they could. All the equipment was dismantled or whatever they could dismantle and was sent to Rostock to their sister distillery. Uh, obviously, Germans retreated. There was uh, quite a lot of bombardment, especially industrial uh, buildings. Over 90% of uh, Szczecin industrial infrastructure was completely destroyed. Luckily, that building wasn't one of them. Like, it, absolute miracle that it survived. It really is. Um, because, like, I mean, the bombings were absolutely super heavy. We still see the effects of in the region today. Some of the cities were leveled to the ground completely. Um, so you still see the effects uh, till today's day, um, very much so. Um, when the Soviets arrived to Szczecin, obviously they came into the building, they took whatever the Germans didn't take, and then they drank <laughs> whatever was left and destroyed a lot of things. Just basically run, run a mock through the whole distillery, destroyed anything that was in their path. But that was quite common with the Soviet army at the time. And, you know, a lot like uh, German soldiers, soldiers were absolutely scared and even, you know, surrendering to the Soviets, they rather surrender to the US because they knew they got treated better. So um, it's quite common. I'm not surprised they're pissed off. You know, the Germans were, you know, destroying their country as well. So look, we won't get into war now. Um, the company was set up then in 1946. So the way it worked, obviously, communism was enforced in Poland after the war, and every industrial industry, every industry was basically um, uh, nationalized. So everything was owned by the country. So Poland uh, set up a company called Palmos, which is po uh, Polish uh, spirit monopole. I think that's that's the best translation I could get. And basically, they owned all the distilleries in Poland at the time. And what they've done was they've given each distillery different products to produce. They've chosen Szczecin for Starka because they had all this amazing cellars for maturation. So they said, well, that's the best place to, to do it. 
uh, the first bottles of Starka from Szczecin uh, landed on the shelves in 1955. Uh, it was a first was a five year old whiskey, or whatever you want to call it, or aged vodka. Uh, it was in half a liter bottles, and they only produced about 5,090 bottles. Uh, I don't think you can. I don't think anyone owns one, but if they do, wow, that's amazing. Um, they. Uh, over time, obviously, they, they've produced more and more and more, and they all kind of pile them up into the cellars and the distillery. And, you know, they're selling uh, various different variants, different ages, different uh, strengths. Usually, they, they sold it at either 50% or 40% strength. They are not actually making any of the distillate there. They were outsourcing it from elsewhere to their specific... Um, a specific recipe that they had to add a certain amount of aldehydes and esters from the right distillate, uh, usually distilled in continuous stills. Uh, straight after the war, they were using pot stills, but then moved on to continuous stills just because it was a cheaper process. And obviously, anything about communism, tell you everything is made to the cheapest way possible or the most efficient way possible. And um, so they are making. Uh, vast majority of it in continuous stills. And they're distilling it to about 96 degrees and 96% ABV, and then diluting it down to 60% for maturation. Uh, they're outsourcing, as I was saying, from different distillers. The first distillate arrived in 47 to 48, 1947-1948, and it was pumped into a 6,000 liter vat that's still in the cellar today, still with that liquid there from that time. So they have is it eight years old now, been around. Um, and they still have it. And they, I think it's just a little under halfway full. So there's still quite a good bit of it there. Um, in 91, obviously, the communists, uh, you know, they're, they weren't in charge of the country anymore. So all the national industries were privatized. Private companies were established. Palmos was established then as a private company. But they were struggling quite a bit, and they started beginning to sell off a few of the brands, a few of the distilleries. And because of their debts, the, the government actually took over uh, the Starka factory and owned it till 2012. Uh, they're still producing uh, Starka. The last Starka that they've released under the government ownership was in 2007. It was an 18-year-old that was made specifically for the tall ships races, which was hap happened in 2007 and 2008, I think it was when water. So I actually moved over in 2007 and in 2008, I was in uh, I was in Ireland. So just at the wrong time where I was moving over to Ireland. Um, and then that was the last one we saw for quite some time from Starka. And then in 2012, another company took over, which was an investment company that was backed by another investment company. and. They only bought it to resell it. Uh, they've estimated that the stocks that were stored in in Szczecin at the at the time were worth some close of seventy million euros, three hundred five million zloty, uh, so quite a bit, and it's still there. Uh, obviously, the, the only reason they bought it was to resell it. They uh, finally found um, another company that was uh, willing to buy it. Uh, they were called Impression Investment, I think. Later renamed in a different way. Um, and they basically agreed upon that they were going to pay for the distillery in installments. And that happened in 2016. So in 2016, this is where this was bottled. So new owners came in. They started bottling things uh, together. And they were meant to pay in installments. Last installment was meant to happen in November of 2018. They didn't even pay one rate. So they just literally went down to the distillery, took some stock, bottled it up, sold it, and never basically paid for it. So the companies were, well, the company that previously owned the distillery wasn't too happy. And then they got into a court case and court argument. And uh, they finally took over the running of the, the facility and fired the previous management and filed a court case against them saying that they didn't fulfill their contract uh, of purchase of the distillery. As a revenge, the other company decided to file another court case, which said that 
whatever uh, decisions that the company made uh, under new management has to be null and void because nothing was agreed. Mm -hmm. So now they're basically in a standstill in a court case where one court case has to be solved before another has to be solved. So they're basically at a standstill and obviously COVID is not helping. The last court case happened in 2019 and it's no sight and end, unfortunately. It is a huge piece of Polish history and Polish like alcohol production, I think. And it's just so sad to see a company that has 70 million euros worth of stock as some 30,000 barrels sitting underneath just waiting to be poured into the bottles and enjoyed. And these people are fighting over it instead of producing this amazing, amazing, amazing liquid that's in front of us. So, so if you're from Kilkenny and you won that lotto ticket this week and you're enjoying this, you please, know spend your money. please buy it, please. And hire me as well at the same time. And I'll run it for you. I absolutely, I, I, I cannot express how disappointed I am that this is not being advertised the way it should be because I think it's a fantastic product and has so much history, so much heritage connected to Polish history that is just unbelievable to see that they're not taking advantage of it. I think you've driven, or driven the anticipation of tasting it. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But you should see when I was opening the bottle. Like, I mean... You mean when you lifted the cork yeah, and the cork stayed? The cork stayed, the yeah. Uh, yeah, just yeah. add it, add it to, the, to the whole thing. But yeah, I was, I, I was really excited to try it for the first time. This is the first dark I ever tried. And obviously my family was in the hospitality business for quite some time. And I always heard just legends about Stark and how amazing it is and this, that and the other. And I was like, Jesus Christ, I'd love to try it someday, but uh, they're not easy to come by and they're not cheap. And that's why you started high. <laughs> and that's why I started with the 35 year olds. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, after all this history, we can finally taste it. You probably did already, but yeah. Um, the anticipation is probably way too much for what it actually is, but look, I, I love it. Um, I'm biased and I don't care. <laughs> so we're just to break down what you said into a small little teeny tiny thing. So we're talking all rye, we're talking column distillation. Yeah. Uh, we're talking wood barrels. Are we still on the fortified Hungarian side of things so, or? It's hard to say because like the people involved with the company, they're really not open yeah. to talk about it. They say, oh, it's a secret, it's a secret, but like it can keep so many things a secret, especially when you're not selling it for God's sake. Um, so they're saying that like they're done, they don't really want to say like what's what's being put into the barrels. Like I've, I've heard stories that there are certain uh, types of tree leaves put into the barrels mm. with the distillate, mm. but is that correct? I don't know. Maybe. Um, hard, hard to say. So we'll go off the points that we do know. We know it's 100% right. Yes. We know that it's wooden barrels. Yes. And we know it's column distillation. Yes. We know it's 35 years old. Yes. And we know Daniel Mullally said it's his favorite so far. Yes. Very we good. You're happy. happy. <laughs> very happy. What percentage are we sitting at? Uh, this is at 40%, but they also do have a version... Uh, at 50%. I'm not sure if it's the same ages. They might be different ages. I was going to say, coming coming off distillation and dropping to 60%, what's the climate like in Poland? If you're going from 60 to Now, uh, this is this yeah. is aged in those famous cellars. So the cellars uh, were built in 1970, uh, 1873. They go, uh, the lowest level goes down 50, 20, 20, 25 meters below ground. Temperature is at a constant level. Uh, I think it doesn't reach any higher than 12 degrees Celsius at the higher level. The lower level is even colder. Um, it, the humidity is at 90%, so the loss would be uh, quite small. Um, what they do first is they have uh, big, massive vats that you actually can see on the bottle. There is like an etching. I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera. No, you can't. How about this way? Well, no, afterwards, okay. if you Never mind. if you follow Bottle Views um, Instagram, they'll have pictures up of the actual bottle itself and all the details yeah. and story and behind exactly. It. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, the, the that's the the big mm. vat, and they have a couple of the, those bigger vats. This one that, that I'm talking about is called Catherine the Great, or Fat Catherine, 
and that's at 36,000 liters. So what they do initially is they pump the new distillate into that big vat. They mm -hmm. let it sit there for a year or two, and then they pump it into smaller barrels aging, uh, ranging between 200 to 1,000 liters. Now, since we're talking after communism, uh, during communism, most of those barrels, a vast majority of those barrels were, uh, uh, were filled. Uh, this was actually filled during uh, a time of... Um, big unrest in Poland it was 8081 when there was a, a military uh, operation for a year and you know there was a police hour you couldn't leave the house my mom was telling me you know she had to be home by six otherwise she'd get a ticket yeah uh, so that's when this was distilled so they're saying that they were using uh four to five wines originally like back in the day you know pre-war time um, I would imagine that they stuck with that to a certain extent, but obviously couldn't source certain barrels. Uh, Polish nobility love uh, Portuguese fortified wine like port, so it wasn't uncommon to see some port being uh, some port barrels being used in Poland for Starka. Uh, I would say that was not the case during communism, um, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't get good barrels. Hungary was communist at the time, so I would imagine that... Uh, that the relationship stuck and they still were able to source those barrels. Also, some brandies from Moldova, Romania, maybe some wine barrels from Yugoslavia and that part of the uh, that part of um, the Eastern Bloc. So, like, I mean, they couldn't source the barrels from West, but they I think they had enough good quality barrels that they were able to source from the Eastern Bloc. You know, with Yugoslavia, with Romania, with Moldova, with you can definitely tell whatever it is they do use is good quality to the point where we are at 35 years old yeah it isn't like licking a stave it isn't that no. wooded and you're saying like um column distillation and you're dropping that down column distillation is usually low on the flavors of the grain and high on the alcohol yeah. content but this screams rye the whole way yeah. through it is unbelievably oily and viscous that kind of rye side of the oily um, and they chill filter it as well so you're mm -hmm. obviously losing a little bit there yeah. also unfortunately they chill filter and i think that's just because of bad practice and like mm -hmm. uh, you know usually you say don't say anything nice if you uh, don't say anything bad if you have nothing nice to say but look you guys need to pull the finger out of your backside because you have a fantastic product <laughs> and you're just not doing it right um especially with selling but yeah they I think they just weren't exposed to the new ways of doing things and they just chill filtration was common in communist and just ease of use and you know you didn't have problems with sedimentation and things like say, that. Yeah, you also have that side of things where your your temperature fluctuations are huge. So if it is non chill filtered, you're you, gonna see something after dramatic. A, yeah, while after a while you could expect something. So that's why the chill filter but obviously this is uh, this is hundred percent right all over. There's no mistake in that no this mistake. is that grain. Yeah. When it comes to the, the creaminess, the oiliness, the viscosity of it and um that spice. But for someone that's thirty five years in wood, I've tried things that are eighteen to twenty five years old where the wood is the dominant flavor profile and then you're getting everything else. Yeah. And then you try something that's twenty five years old plus that's not in a fortified wine cask. Again, the wood is one of the dominating factors. Yeah. And with this, the rye is the dominating factor. Yeah. Um, to me, what this smells like is I would imagine that that's how the cellars smell like when you go mm. into them. You can actually, if you're ever in Shechin, you can book a tour. There is someone that will take you there. Obviously, maybe not now, but down the line. And they'll take you to the tour and they'll show you the barrels. They'll show you the, the cellars. It's unbelievable. Like I haven't been, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually pissed off that I haven't been because it's so close to where I'm from. But I never got a chance. You know, usually you go to the doctors or whatever when you're going back home, visiting families and barbecues, whatnot. You never get a chance to do some touristy stuff. And um, this has been, a, this has been on my list for so long. And I'd imagine that this smells like that whole cellar smells. They just get that mustiness, that kind of, you know, wet brick walls something along those lines and it really encapsulates the whole story behind i think with this so um it's great that they at least bottle a couple of things like they when that company was in charge for brief periods of time they've did a three a six and a nine-year-old that were like liqueurs they called it brown spirit 
in fact they're kind of terrible mm -hmm. because they've uh, they've actually went with the practice of adding leaves and different uh, tinctures of or whatnot. They made it very herbal. It was like a herbal liqueur, more closer to kind of like your Bekarovskas Bekarovska and stuff. Uh, just completely ruined it, unfortunately. But yeah, the older expressions are much more what they should be like. Especially Where John just, says it's grassy on the nose and it reminds me of Zborka. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's there's some, some part of that uh, in there as well on the nose. But yeah, to me, it's just that musty smell of cellar. That's what I'm getting. As long as really... it doesn't remind you of bison grass, all is good. <laughs> um, yeah, the, I was going to ask actually earlier on when you were saying the, the tea leaves being steeped in and tree leaves and stuff like that, if it was a kind of practice that was more a medicinal practice where you're trying to get that bitter herb effect or if it was more your column distilling and you might have off flavors and you're trying to mask them with I, I, something else. I'm pretty sure it was for masking when they're talking about Starka, because I think Starka had enough of a name behind it that they were just trying yeah. to imitate the flavor of it with steeping it in different things rather than using it for medicinal purposes. Because as I was saying, in 1800s, it was quite prevalent for nobles to literally have barrels upon barrels of different Starkas, different years. Well, that's the thing you're, you're talking about it as if like we're talking about single malt we're talking about rye we're talking about categories and starka free is more of a category it's a category of, yeah. in itself yeah yeah like you'd never say oh starka is a whiskey no no starka it, it's like turning around saying cognac and brandy you're you're still talking about a style yeah. of spirit but you're talking about this yeah. is a regionality and yeah a it, um so did this starka can only be, be produced in Shechin when uh, the communist government was setting up and they you know mm. they were giving away the products they actually given away the rights to make starka to mm. them solely mm. so not only if anyone's buying that distillery make sure to remember my name as well uh but when they're buying the distillery they're buying the style as yeah. well at the same time so yeah give me 70 million please <laughs> no actually the distillery was bought for 16 million so even though the stock uh underneath the sellers were 70 million and they probably sell it for 16. Uh, but very likely they will sell it for 16 because they so just, change yeah so like, i mean if you have a chunk of change of 16 million yeah absolutely just go oh, and buy it buy I, it from 16 you take a look out a loan from 17 you make it in <laughs> straight away and you get something for 53 less than you need to yeah no um but mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it, I think it's a shame. It's a really, it's a big shame that this is not more famous than it should be. But then again, as I was saying, I'm completely biased. I hope that, yeah, I hope I hope that uh, you think the same. That it is amazing. Um, yeah, no, this Danny finished his already. Winged Hussars, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what else to say about it because I'd have to say bad things. But please, the two companies are involved in this. Please just sort it out. Please <laughs> just start making a, more of this. The, the oldest this, the distill that they've ever made was actually a 50-year-old. So they had a 50-year-old on the portfolio. Also. Which is in the next tasting. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Uh, the bottles are quite expensive. I was looking at them, but like you're talking in tens and thousands of Zloty now at this stage. Uh, the bottle is like canned crystal carb all that crap um, 20 past nine now so if you want to yeah to... sorry no, um no. i just like to thank the boys from like the, the the miniature forum society i think it's called in polish especially a guy called uh, chaikus he's like a, a blogger in poland and uh, he did a lot of that research and i contacted him and he gave me a big um uh, a big article that he researched himself so a lot of that info is through him and thank you very much because you know he sent me a, 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 a screenshot of the whole article and it was a great sport trying to help me out cool. with the information so thank you um yeah we'll move on to the last one uh so this is from netherlands it's called millstone is made in the zuidam distillery in braille nassau in netherlands is on the on the border with belgium very close to the border actually and this is Adrian's last attempt at swaying you away from the Starka. Yeah, it's not going to work probably because <laughs> it's so, so amazing. But anyway, um, so Zudam Distillery was set up by 
Frank or Fred von Zuidam. I'm sorry if I'm not saying the, the right name, but I, I just can't remember now. Uh, in 1975, and basically he started uh, with one small copper still and was making gin Geneva and other flavored liqueurs at the time. Uh, a few years later, his, uh, his wife joined him and kind of helped him out with the bottle designs and other ins and outs of running of the distillery. And they start getting more and more success, obviously, over time. Um, in 89, two of their sons joined in to help out as well. One of them is Patrick. I think he's the master distiller and chief operator of the distillery. Um, they actually own their own uh, field as well. So 70% of the grain that they use to make whiskey is actually produced by them as well. So kind of grain to glass situation. Um, they have six different pot stills now. Two of them are used for whiskey, two of them are used for Geneva, and then one is like a, a kind of a small hybrid still. I'm not sure if they're using it, and I think they have an old Geneva still, which is not in use anymore, but it's still there. The city is quite small, uh, as they actually have the maturation warehouse in the same building as they have in the distilling equipment, so everything is matured in the same building. Uh, what's unique about it as well is that when they rack up the barrels, with such a limited space, they actually cannot take out the barrels when they need to disgorge them to take the liquid out. So what they do is they actually pump out the liquid and then pump the new liquid in when they think it's ready. Um, they, as I was saying, the barley that they're using is mostly from their own farm. 30% is subsidized from different local Dutch farmers. If they're using peated malt, again, it's again from Scotland. Uh, because of the quality, so they are making some peated whiskies as well, but it's not with their barley, it's excuse me, it's, it's with the outsourced barley uh, already um, on top of that they make other liqueurs like Geneva and Gin and other bits and bobs Aquavit I think as well and mm -hmm. this is a 100% malted barley aged minimum of 12 years in sherry casks they use different types of sherry casks so they use obviously the big sherry casks uh, you know the proper sherry butts uh, but they also um reuse recoupered smaller sherry casks that are recouped about 200 225 liters uh, in capacity uh, Patrick himself loves using sherry barrels uh, as um, as a main um main maturation barrel but obviously due to the costs it's not as cheap as again bourbon barrels so bourbon barrels are the most predominant barrels used but they also do use quite a lot of sherry if they can um he actually prefers second second filled sherry rather than the first filled sherry because he thinks that the flavors just become a little bit more delicate and a little bit easier to work with on top of that they also like experimenting with different types of grains in their mashed so for example he was saying that they've used buckwheat uh, they've used quinoa, they've used wheat, they've used barley, they've used oats, they've used quite a, a, a big amalgamation of different uh, different uh, grains. But this is all malted barley, the, the way it's, it, it's made usually, so nothing, nothing crazy in the mash bill there. Um, depending on the grain, the, the fermentation in itself can take quite a long time, even up to 96 hours. But... Then again, different grains, different, uh, different, uh, different length of time. Um, beer is usually around seven percent. Double, it's double distilled. Stills are kind of regular, standard shape. But you usually see none, uh, nothing uh, crazy. There's a little bit of a bulge on the neck, but other than, other than that, it's quite standard. Um, this is a a mixture of a few different barrels. I would imagine there is first fill and check the second fill sherry in that. And it is bottled at 46%. Um, yeah, I think that's... And I think your hybrid still is the Aquavit still. I think the, the hybrid still is the one with um, uh, chamber inside, hold your botanicals, so you're vapor infusing. I, I, mm. I, I'm not sure if it was like a, a glance yeah. in the video that they weren't really, you know, concentrating on the on these old, older says, but I would imagine that's no, they're, I know that's they do the Geneva, case. they're definitely doing Aquavit as well. I think that's how they're doing it, that they're vapor infusing and coal compound. Okay. 
yeah, I, 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 I would be, I'd be, I would be inclined to say the same. But yeah, obviously, it's, it's uh, so the twelve years is all sharing. There's no bourbon, no nothing. It's all full sherry. Yeah, as I was saying, for first, probably second, maybe even third fill, uh, sherry barrels. Comes across like it's second fill more predominantly than yeah, um, anything else. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, Patrick does prefer second fill sherry mm -hmm. barrels because um, he feels that the flavors are a little bit more delicate. A huge amount of nuttiness to it. It's lovely. And huge, soft. huge, yeah, huge. Um, Usually when you're describing kind of marzipan uh, almond nuttiness to a, a sherry, second fill usually will carry that across a lot more than the first fill. Mm. Yeah, like, I mean, this reminds me a lot of um, Bushman's 10, the retail, like, the travel exclusive. Uh, we did a bottle share not so long ago, the, the orange bottle. If you, mm. by the way, if you're traveling not so, you know, in a not so distant future, get yourself a bottle like it's it's quite tasty. Um, I and yeah, go to whiskey shop, grab another batch of it. Um, mm. It really reminded me of a lot of the the Celtic Zone um, Celtic Cast series because they usually go a lot fortified wine heavy and Virgin Cast fortified wine heavy or second fill fortified wine heavy. And yeah, it has that kind of big nutty sherry influence and whiskey as opposed to whiskey with a Big sherry influence. Yeah. Yeah. And John was saying, yeah, again, Bushman's on the nose. Yeah, I'm getting it exactly as I was saying. It reminds me a lot of that Bushman's single malt and sherry. It's just like, you know, they're, mm. they're, um, their business card, really, you know, that's what they're famous for. And uh, you're getting a good bit of that. Like, you know, we can, uh, like, that's what we're getting straight away because mm. we will associate Bushman's uh, with that kind of style. And yeah, I think, I think they've, well, that's it. When you're doing component tastings and when they are cast strength and it is a big, unmistakable fortified wine influence, it's going to come across like that. Yeah. As you said, we're so used to bush mills, it will be kind of one of the first things to come to your mind. But um, for me on this one, it's drawn me more back towards the Celtic Whiskey Shops Celtic Cast Series because it's it's like you're tasting a fortified wine that's been finished in a unbelievable whiskey cask as opposed to the opposite way around because mm. it's more fortified notes straight off the bat yeah and being brought up by whiskey yeah um it's i think it, it, it's top quality i was very surprised with the, the the quality of the the spirit in itself and the barrels really came across really nicely well like obviously you've probably tasted some of the whiskeys that were over sherried mm. and you know they're quite hard to take a bite on and i i was looking at the bottle and you know when when it's full it was like black yeah. i was like jesus this is gonna be a, a huge sherry bomb that maybe not every everyone will like it and you know it'll be too offensive mm. even and, uh, that's what i was thinking just by looking at the color and as everyone says every expert says don't judge the whiskey by its color and it proved me proved me right um well, that's it. You have the 16 year old Bushmills, which is almost purple in the bottle. Yeah. By the time you pour it as a dram in a glass, you're like, it's golden. There's mm. a bit of a purple hue to it, but how is this the same as in the yeah. big bottle? You can see that when it's like, yeah. it's really deep color in the yeah. glass, but as a big bottle, it's yeah, going it was, to be very it, it was nearly black. And I was just like, oh my God, this is going to be over sherry or something like that. It's not going to be nice. But yeah, it's it's pretty good. I have to say it's a, it's a, it's a pretty tasty dram as, um, well, that's what happens when you're playing with second and third fill. You're still leaving the distinctive character behind. It's still got a huge sherry influence on it. Like it's, it's something you is can't it, ignore. Is it, but is it close to like an Irishman seventeen? The sherry casks, obviously, that is a fifty six. Is it? I think it's more. It's more sherry forward. Um, it's more sherry yeah. than seventeen. So, okay. the, um, with the the Irishman seventeen is technically Bushmills listed. It so like mm -hmm. um. You're getting more apple first, and then the wine in behind. For me, on this one, you're getting more uh, Chardonnay kind of um, grapes and uh, kind of a Pinot Grigio kind of crisp grape. And okay, then you're getting, yeah, yeah. I uh, see where you're coming from. Yeah, first, and then apples more in the background. Not getting that kind of pair, but the, the citrus is kind of in the middle. The apples in the background, as opposed to the Irish man, which would be your orchard fruit first your citrus second and your wine in behind yeah um good subtleties in behind great layers but this seems to be a flip reverse where the wine is up front you're getting more of the sherry influence first yeah and then yeah, the, the malt yeah. itself is in the background kind of 
saying hello i am actually a whiskey <laughs> um yeah man of l'amour um uh, the red breast a little oh, bit like love. That. yeah yeah um okay um what do we think what's what do you think is your favorite uh just out of curiosity i'd like to see um out of all the seven obviously you don't have to say starka that's just me being silly you know uh please Tell me which one you like the most, because I am actually really interested to see what, uh, what what people are thinking. Like to me, the Starka is obviously closest to my heart, so I'm just gonna keep it out there. Out of all the other ones, I would tend to go towards Millstone, the last one. Um, I think Puni would be my second. And then I would say Amarut. No, sorry. I'm saying it wrong. Millstone, Amarut, and then Puni. I think that would be my top three. And I'm taking I'm taking Starka out of uh, out of the equation because I will say Starka anyway. So apart from Starka, that'd be my top three. Um what do you, what would be yours? If you can put your finger on it. <laughs> I can put my fingers on it. <laughs> I can reach. Um for something being unbelievably distinct, the Starica is just unbelievably distinctly right. The last one, um, it, Millstone, is unbelievably distinctly sherry. So for layers of flavor, I'm going to Italy simply because the nose is telling you one story, the palate's telling you another, the finish is telling you something else. It's complex, or it's complex, it's layered. You don't expect to get what you're getting with the Starica. You can tell it's rye up front and it delivers rye the whole way through. Yeah. It's a great rye story. Um, with this, it's sherry up front, it's sherry through the middle, and then you remember that it's actually a whiskey. Um, tastes really, really good. rest of them are pretty much evenly balanced. Um, Macamara is, is lovely, but it's very sweet. You have to get three, four sips in before you get the rest of what's in behind it. Um, number two in New Zealand... Uh, too much tannins for me mm -hmm. um it is still nice but it's too much tannins for me it, it's taking over the whole thing itself yeah um the one that's delivering the most it's just seem, it seems like it's just there's something out of balance there yeah um, the thing that's delivering the most is probably the millstone because even though it's fortified wine heavy and cherry heavy there's enough nuts there's enough um wine and grapes there's enough kind of uh orchard fruit molten behind yeah. it and there's a good bit of spice in there so yeah yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, but as yeah. always, to taste something that's older than everyone in the room. Yeah, oh, like I mean, I'm so happy we got to do it, uh, just because of it, uh, just because I was able to open that bottle, and uh, really is amazing. Actually, I have another bottle. I have an 18 year old as well. I don't know if you can see it in the cameras. Can you see? Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of how the bottles are uh, designed. You know, they has like a, an engraved back, and it has basically different pictures from the, the, the from the sellers itself. So they show just different rooms in the in the distillery. You have three minutes. If you can repeat his entire Starka speech from start to finish, <laughs> you get to win the eighteen year old. <laughs> Sorry, I should clarify: eighteen year old whiskey. Nothing else is enough. <laughs> uh, on that note, <laughs> on that note uh, thank you all so very much for taking part in this taste and I hope I didn't bore you to death with the story of Starka and the story of other whiskeys and I hope you enjoyed yourself very much um, we have other things planned uh, there's another tasting that me and Chris have been putting together for a little bit uh, are we gonna yeah yeah okay so we are doing a cask strength crusade tasting which is all going to be all irish and all cask strength so i'd say everyone here is nearly the years are jumping up and down at this stage um it, it's a fantastic lineup like i mean you couldn't ask for a better lineup um there are some whiskeys that do not even exist on the shelves i i can't even say what the name is or let alone take a picture of the bottle so 
There's cast samples from distilleries. There's recent releases and old releases yeah. that don't exist anymore. Um, everything is cast strength. Uh, there's all different types of, uh, there's not one company repeated twice. It's all different brands, all different brands. Yeah. And we purposely did it in such a way that each like this, each one of the flavor profiles are completely contrasting to the last one. So you're not going to have two side by side going this exact same fruit, yeah. and exact same spice. Um, just to show the, the difference in diversity in the Irish market. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's gonna be amazing. Uh, the taste and like we we haven't settled the date yet, um, but uh, we're hoping to do it soon, as soon as possible. Uh, obviously, that depending on the free time that we have. I have quite a lot. Chris has a little bit less. Uh, but yeah, we'll 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 meet in the middle and we'll definitely announce it either to my channel or to Chris's channels. And you know, yeah, it'll go through both. It'll go, yeah, we'll figure it out anyway. But yeah, keep your eyes open. We'll definitely do another amazing tasting. And don't forget to enter our giveaway as well. Um, it's still running up until Sunday, so make sure you share the shit out of it and post it to your friends, your nanny, and whatnot. She might win, you know, she might even share some samples with you if you want or not. Um, and if you want a 90% better chance, hashtag Starka. <laughs> hashtag Starka, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Anyway, listen, guys, once again, thank you so much for taking part. I hope you enjoyed yourself and have a pleasant evening and enjoy the rest of your samples. Cheers. Nazdrovie.